All right, guys, and it is just about 1 p.m., so we're gonna be we're gonna be starting our podcast here with uh, Andrew and John. Um, thank you for joining us once again, John, and uh, thank you for joining us for the first time, Andrew. Andrew's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thanks for having me on. As well. Yeah, um, and, uh, if you can, just briefly, uh, since it's your first time on the show, Andrew, just kind of go over what your interests are, where you're going to school right now, what you plan on doing for your dissertation. Sure, yeah. So I'm a third year doctoral student at the University of Chicago in philosophy, and um, I work primarily on Kant, um, especially Kant's practical philosophy. That's what I'm doing my dissertation on. Um, I'm primarily doing my dissertation on what's called the typic of practical reason and second critique. Um, but then I also work on German idealism and history of political philosophy. And just for the audience sake, um, since this is what we're going to be talking about, uh, you end up actually disagreeing with Kant on his practical philosophy and would like to instead embrace a sort of Thomistic uh, metaphysics and a Thomistic view on ethics. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in Thomism by any means. I'm kind of a tentative uh, Thomist. Uh, there, there are elements of Kant's uh, theoretical philosophy that bleed into his practical philosophy that I have um, problems with. And I think a Thomistic alternative would probably be a better foundation to ethics. Okay. And uh, just briefly for this episode, John, if you'd like to also reintroduce yourself and tell us what your interests are and you know why these would merge right here with the, the discussion. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a first year doctoral student in a PhD program. Uh, sorry, sorry, in a philosophy program, I mean, and uh, my main interests are in Kant's philosophy as a system, so theoretical, practical, and the connection between the two. Um, so I'm excited to have the discussion on Kant's practical philosophy. Should be good. And, uh, well, everyone already knows sort of what I'm doing here. Um, you know, today's podcast should be pretty fun. Uh, these guys definitely uh, definitely probably know a little bit more about Kant than I do. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up, uh, well, not wrap up, we'll, uh, we'll get to the first conversation, uh, which is going to be uh, more of a theoretical project and then move on to the practical project. Um, since John has already been here, these, these questions will probably be more for uh, Andrew here. Um, so, um, since you know a little bit about Kant, Andrew, uh, before we delve into the cosmological and ontological arguments, if you can tell us what your interests are, and particularly in Kant, why one would want to sort of dive into that system, why transcendental philosophy, and then maybe why one would want to exit transcendental philosophy, in your opinion, or if you're, you know, if you're not completely committed to that position, or you're still speculating, if you want to offer some thoughts there. Sure, yeah. Um, so as far as my own interests in Kant go, um, before getting into why one would want to be a Kantian, um, so I work primarily, like I said, on Kant's practical philosophy, and there's a big effort among late 20th century neo-Kantians to decouple Kant's practical thought from his system of transcendental idealism. So the thought is transcendental idealism is a bizarre and complicated system. We don't want to get into that, so we'll try to somehow weave between that and um, the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, and we have this kind of freestanding moral project um, that we can work. So I think Rawls and Christine Korsgaard are kind of paradigmatic cases of people who want to achieve this. And a big part of my dissertation is arguing against this, that in Kant's own view, the two are systematically connected, the theoretical and the practical domains, and that we can really only understand his practical philosophy in the context of transcendental idealism. Um, so without that, you get a very strange view that's very detached from what histor what Kant historically believed. Um, so that's kind of motivating my own academic interest in Kant. As far as why one would want to be a transcendental idealist or Kantian in general, I guess it's Kant is responding to fundamental problems raised in, in modern philosophy that begin arguably with someone like Descartes and then culminate in Hume's skepticism. And um, Hume's skepticism raises questions about the possibility of scientific knowledge. Um, these are questions that motivate the first critique, awoke Kant from his so-called dogmatic slumbers, and that transcendental idealism is an attempt to ground the possibility of scientific knowledge um, in response to these skeptical questions that have kind of devastated traditional realist 
approaches to uh, to metaphysics. So Kant's laying down the foundations of a different kind of metaphysics, um, a, uh, a, trans a critical and transcendental metaphysics rather than a dogmatic and speculative metaphysics in order to ground the possibility of knowledge. Um, so that's a, a big um, project, I guess, kind of a, an ambiguous way of putting it. That's kind of the main reason why one would want to enter into the Kantian system. Um, and I think that there are various reasons why you'd want to exit the Kantian system. Um, the biggest one historically to which German idealism and German romanticism are responses is the fact that Kant draws all these very clean distinctions, for example, between, reason, between sensibility and understanding, between mind and world, supposedly, um, between um, uh, the moral law and um, our ability for sensible affection. Uh, so Schiller's criticism between moral law and beauty, sense of beauty, um, and that all these distinctions end up um, leaving us in a leaving us with the difficulty of explaining how these two distinguished spheres of human experience relate to one another. Um, how do sensibility and understanding relate to one another? How do form and content relate? Um, I think that motivates a lot of the post-Kantian criticism, people like Schiller and Hegel, um, as well as kind of the Thomistic criticism of Kant, which wants to somehow return before modern philosophy, before these kind of mistakes are baked into the cake. So there are kind of different approaches you could take to avoid Kant or to exit the system. That's basically my view at this time. Can you tell me a little bit more? I'm not familiar with Schiller's um, criticism of Kant. Uh, what is that exactly? If yeah, so Schiller wrote um, a series of letters um, that are called the um, Aesthetische Briefe, or the Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man, I think is how they're usually translated in English. And then he, he wrote a few other essays about um, beauty that were criticizing the third critique. Um, and basically Schiller's view is that on this kind of vulgar Kantianism, um, which he attributes to Kant, you have this distinction between um, the moral law um, and our ability to be motivated by a sense of duty, um, reverence for the moral law, by pure practical reason alone. And then on the other hand, the human um, sensible nature, which in would include um, you know, our ability to be affected by a sense of beauty mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and sensible inclination. And Schiller thinks uh, for various reasons that this distinction um, and this radical divide in Kant's thought um, is anthropologically problematic. Um, that's a bad um, division to allow to kind of fester. And he thinks that it plays itself out politically in the French Revolution, um, which Schiller thought was a disaster politically. Um, because in the French Revolution, you have forces of pure practical reason kind of trampling on human sensible nature by destroying kind of the concrete historical mode of life and community in France, um, imposing this abstract regime that can only be imposed by violence. So that's kind of Schiller's political motivation in writing these, the letters on the aesthetic education of man. The idea is that we somehow have, have, somehow have to heal this divide in human nature through, Schiller thinks, the experience of beauty relates our sensible and rational um, faculties. Um, and that can kind of bridge the divides that Kant has sundered, um, and then also kind of lead the path forward to some sort of political alternative to, to Jacobinism. That's Schiller's basic critique in the, uh, the letters. See, By the way, uh, John, anytime you feel like you want to um, interrupt or anything like that, go feel free. I mean, do you want me to go on or did you want to contribute anything there john i was just thinking that's an ironically i haven't read schiller or these, or these letters in particular but that's an ironically very kantian approach to how to reconcile sensibility right. and understanding i mean that sounds like exactly the kind of connection between sensibility and understanding or even between reason and understanding but then also our sensible nature and our intelligible nature that kant seems to affect in the critique of judgment do you think that but you describe Schiller's view as a vulgar sort of Kantian, Kantianism, or like, like his his view of what Kant's view is as a vulgar picture of what Kant's view is. Do you think that he's that drastically uh, mis misreading the critique of judgment, that indeed the very thing that he thinks is wrong with the critique of judgment, or the very thing that he thinks we need to have instead of what Kant has in the critique of judgment is in fact there in the critique of judgment? 
I'm, I'm just looking up when the letters were actually written. So they were written in 1794, and the critique of judgment was when? Um, 1790. Okay, so the letters were written after the critique of judgment. They're primarily yeah. meant, I think, as a, as a critique of Kant's um, uh, practical philosophy, um, I, where the role of beauty is not yet fully developed um, as this kind of interme intermediary um, between our um, our sensible and intelligible natures. But yeah, I, I do think there is something a bit unfair about um, Schiller's letters on the aesthetic education of man, unfair towards Kant. Um, but I mean, even in Kant, it's not quite clear what the, the moral or practical purpose of beauty is. Um, mm -hmm. um, I guess that Schiller is, is asserting that it has a, a much more significant role for, for practice, especially in the political domain. But it's not quite clear that Kant, at least explicitly, um, explicitly argues for that mm. um, in the third critique. You get a, you get a, <clears throat> you get a, a small, uh, at least gesture, I think, within the third critique by Kant, basically by showing how aesthetic judgments would lead one towards being a good soul though um so there does seem to be there does seem to be a sort of a bridge and later on you'll you'll see hegel kind of even go further within that bridge i'm not sure if you guys have read the introduction uh to aesthetics or uh you know basically within hegel but the idea you know within kant's third critique is that you know um Aesthetic judgments can sort of offer a, a narrative, if you will, of how to do the good, right? So if one sees a sort of, to use a Hegelian quote, a painting about war, right? There's a certain sense of where one can, uh, instead of being embodied in the war, sort of abstract themselves when they view that painting, right? They can see the sort of violence that's going about, uh, about and then make a judgment upon, uh, upon that painting and see that that's some form of violence that would one want to abstract from and so someone like hegel might think that you know aesthetics ultimately lead one to um, ethics as a sort of final result whereas kant sort of seems to back out from that but at least gives an indirect gesture towards it if that's my understanding of the third critique um yeah i think that's right in the chat i think you mentioned this as well but uh, the way the role that aesthetics is supposed to play is to show us that uh, our intelligible nature is capable of affecting our sensible nature through the way in which we have this sense of beauty. Um, and it's that parallels the way in which recognition of the moral law, which is purely a matter of our intelligible nature, is something which is able to play this practical role in the operation of our sensible nature as well. It can, as Kant puts it in the groundwork in second critique, it provides an, it can provide an incentive, basically. It's able to affect us sensibly. Yeah. Certain way. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It's interesting to see that that's that Schiller is. I'll have to read the letters. That's that. That sounds worth worthwhile. But it's a short book, so um, yeah. the uh, this gets us a little bit into the third critique. Um, so, um, so let's. I guess let's talk about some of the um, things that you wanted to get out from. You, you're basically. Um, so I don't I don't want to mis, mis, misinterpret you. You seem to have uh, these sorts of criticisms that you kind of see later in German idealism that you know the intent, uh, intelligible and sensible are sort of abstracted. Um, we have this notion of a noumenon. We have this notion of a noumenal subject, um, and presumably these things aren't aren't justified in some sort of sense. I don't, I'm not sure how far you want to take that. Would you hold um, what 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 type of I guess theoretical stance do you have um, with respect to Kant in terms of the various readings that you have in Kant for for example Allison or Elias, like how realist um, how much committed to like a metaphysical reading of Kant uh, do you have Would you say? Yeah, so this is a little bit um, beyond my area of expertise. I, I guess uh, Lucy Elias is. Um... So Elias or Elias? I, I'd never known how to pronounce it, but her, her book Manifest Reality was probably one of the most influential on me, ah, okay. um, which is a kind of, yeah, like a, a kind of um, you know, metaphysical two aspects reading of Kant's uh, philosophy. It, it seems to do justice to um, um, to both the sense in which Kant is a, is a realist, um, does genuinely believe in the mind dependence of um, 
uh, the objects of experience, but is also a kind of uh, idealist in respect to their manifest properties. Okay. Um, yeah. That's kind of my um, orientation. That's uh, that's good. So uh, me and uh, John are both also in the same camp after we read uh, Manifest uh, Reality. So, um, although yeah, although John John, uh, if you want, you know, you also have sympathies with Langton's views on 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 Kant and theoretical philosophy. Oh, I know. I'm not sure I'd say I have sympathies with Lang. Langton's just another example of the kind of metaphysical two aspect reading that I think is okay. Yeah. I think Elias provides a much better version of it since Langdon's is sort of weirdly Leibnizian in a way that definitely can't be true of, of Kant's of Kant's transcendental idealism. Indeed is explicitly criticized in the Amphiboly. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, so what exactly would you say is is a person like your best personal attack against transcendental idealism with Kant then, Andrew? Like what what exactly do you sort of dislike about the project? Because in a way, Kant does allow, I mean, as we get later into practical philosophy, this, this sort of sui generis capacity for acting freely, which, you know, is, is a very good way, I think, of getting outside of like arguments like the consequence argument. Um, it's, a way, it's a great way of basically making um, our rational faculties and our agency possible such that our passions and dispositions and various sentiments aren't, uh, we're, we're not enslaved to those and we're not necessarily subject to those, right? We have this sort of um, sort of self-legislating autonomous capacity. And that seems very attractive. And on top of that, representationalism seems sort of attractive as if we're still in theoretical, uh, in his theoretical philosophy, because, you know, there does seem to be a sense of where experience does come about through two things, right? The spontaneity, human spontaneity and receptivity. And it doesn't seem, you know, if we take the transcendental arguments uh, seriously, uh, easy to sort of escape, right? It doesn't seem like we can just have freestanding experiences or a freestanding mind. There has to be something that sort of stimulates that a sort of receptivity and a sort of spontaneity at the same time. So what are, what are your thoughts exactly on that and the sort of problems that you see with all that? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I, I don't have uh, you know a roadmap about how to to pull our way out of transcendental idealism at this point. I, I guess that kind of the fundamental problem, from my point of view, is that Kant. It, so, what is like the primary datum of experience for Kant? Um, what well, seems to be um, the uh, object that exhibits both matter and form. He counts a kind of transcendental hylomorphous, um, hylomorphous. Um, he doesn't have a very developed philosophy of being, um, and that that seems to be the fundamental problem. That in in Heidegger's essay, the Kant's thesis on being, um, we're left with a kind of strange view that being is simultaneously um, a pure concept of the understanding. Um, it's it, it's a um, it's a determination of modality, um, but uh, then we also have to uh, speak of the being of uh, things in themselves, and by the understanding, because Kant has this view that you know, the uh, objects of experience are simultaneously determined by sensibility and understanding. Things in themselves obviously cannot be um, Gegenstände, they can't be objects in that sense. They're just objects of mere thought. Um, so uh, you know, things in themselves are left out of this sort of synthesis, the synthetic act by which something becomes an object of experience and acquires being in the first place, being for thought. And it seems that Kant doesn't have a developed philosophy to make sense of the being of things in themselves. Um, he seems to be led into strange tensions and contradictions, which German idealism takes along one path by eliminating the thing in itself. Um, classical metaphysics takes upon another path by having a philosophy of mind-independent being. Um, that seems to be the kind of fundamental problem. Um, and I think that classical philosophy at least has some promise with the Aristotelian notion of being as act. Um, being as something that is in, at least independent of our minds, um, if not independent of mind in general. Um, so that that is kind of where I'm thinking right now. Um, path out of Kantianism should should lead um, to develop philosophy of being. I think that's also the problem with Kant's practical philosophy as well. But we can get into that later. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, I had a question for you about, about, about that. If you, but we can take it for later. No, no, no. You, you can go on. Uh, some some people are telling me to turn off my fan because it's distracting. Oh. But yeah, go go ahead. Uh, I'm kind of curious as what you have to say, John. Yeah, well, I'm I'm curious. So, so do you, in, before that that criticism of Heidegger is against Kant, how how do you do you think that the role that Newman play in Kant's practical philosophy, it, Newman being these objects that have a way they are that that are things in themselves and are, are rather than appearances. Um, do you think that the w the way in which Kant justifies us positing noumena through his, his arguments in his practical philosophy provides something in the way of a response to that criticism, or do you think that that, that fails in some way? I think the problem is that Kant is kind of like straddling these two commitments. Um, on the one hand, he does have to posit noumena, things in themselves, both for the sake of his practical philosophy to justify our, our belief in the experience of freedom or our belief in human freedom as well as god and the afterlife mm -hmm. and everything else um yeah. and then also in the theoretical domain in order to explain our being constrained by the objects of experience um but that his philosophy of being um such as it is um his view of modality is a mere concept of the understanding and the understanding is a spontaneous determination of the objects by um our spontaneous contribution um yeah. I don't think it leaves uh, space to make sense of the being of noumena. They're, they're kind of contradictory entities, or at least they seem to be entities in which Kant's kind of like straining himself to explain their ontological status. Um, that's not a developed criticism on my part, but it is a kind of strange um, tension in Kant that I've, I've never been able to see him adequately resolve. Um, his yeah. comments on being are, are pretty scattered, right? He has some comments in his refutation of the ontological argument. It's a very brief section in the uh, the opening and first critique um, where it discusses the transcendental philosophy of the ancients, and he um, very conspicuously leaves out being as one of the transcendentals that he lists. Right. Um, of, uh, unity, truth, and goodness. There's no essay or ends there, um, which is curious. Um, mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I think that that's kind of the, the fundamental weakness. Um, it, it leaves Kant open to the allegation that he is just a pure formalist, which is, you know, what Hegel would accuse Kant of. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Do you so? Do you think then that to to shift away from Numina for a second and into what the pure concept of, of the actuality is, and not even actuality per se, but what Kant can, has to say about being in the Critique of Pure Reason? Do you do you think that Kant's notion of objecthood, so the way in which all of the categories, no no one particular category, but sort of together collectively, all of the categories, uh, uh, provide us with some kind of concept of an object in general, and that that concept of an object in general is in a sense what Kant's thought is on what being qua being is, that his sort of onto his ontology in the scholastic sense is provided in identifying what it is to be an object, where what it is to be an object is to be unified in the way that the categories unify uh, the, uh, the things that we are intentionally directed towards, the things that we recognize in experience, um, and then maybe in the practical philosophy in this new mental way, but set that aside. Um, do you think that that works as an as an account of, of being, an account of being qua being, or some kind of ontological account in the scholastic sense, or do you think that that that's missing something important in that that uh, this that a scholastic or post-Kantian maybe Heideggerian account of, of being can provide instead? If that's a clear question, I have to think about it. No, no, I, I think that's a, a good question. I'd have to think about that a little bit. I mean, on, on the one hand, um, being is, is one of the, the modalities of the understanding. So it's one of the, um, it, it's one of many of the pure concepts of the understanding. But when he's defining the notion of an object in general um, as that which is constituted by uh, all of the categories uh, of understanding, um, apart from sensibility. I mean, that is the definition of an object 
for thought, not an object of experience. My understanding is that the core of Heidegger's point in um, Kant's thesis on being is that because the understanding and sensibility never operate independently, because um, thoughts without content are blind, uh, or thoughts without content are uh, empty. Empty. Empty, pardon me. Um, you know, the, the spontaneous operation of the understanding unmoored from sensibility um, cannot contribute anything more than an object for thought. Um, so, so, so Kant's notion of, of, of being is essentially parasitic upon the operation of sensibility as well. Um, that's how we come to have a determination of, of modality um, is, is through experience, which is why he, he does not have a formalistic conception of truth. Truth depends upon, it's parasitic upon experience, upon the matter that is supplied through sensibility. I, I do think that Kant, in a certain sense, ends up repudiating the notion of metaphysics as the study of being qua being. Um, uh, metaphysics is the study of the, the fundamental principles of being. Um, and because he resolves being uh, into this experiential conception of being, it's the fundamental principles of the constitution of experience. <clears throat> so I, I don't think that Kant is able to really preserve a robust sense of being that's not just parasitic upon presence and experience, which is why he ends up, when he does speak of being, it's a, it's a mere positing, a mere presencing um, before the subject. Hmm. Um, right. Can you okay. briefly, can you briefly before John continues, if you want, can you just for myself and the audience? I'm not I'm not quite sure what you mean by Kant being a formalist or a formalist about certain types of things. Yeah. Um, so so Kant's so-called uh, formalism, uh, according to Hegel, uh, to his view, I have to to think about the the proper way of defining this, but sure. Yeah. The allegation of, of formalism uh, that Hegel levels against Kant is that um, thought for Kant uh, supplies only the, the form of experience, and Kant is only um, tending to or interested in the, uh, in the abstract form of experience, where the content of experience or its matter is supplied by something that is kind of insulated from the, the critical project. Um, you know, it's, it's provided through sensibility, and that's kind of something that's separate from um, uh, the forms of the understanding. Um, it's, it's something that's kind of like um, opaque to our examination. Um, Kant can really only pay attention to the, uh, only provide a, a critical analysis to the mind's formal contribution to experience. Um, that's the, the allocation of, of formalism. And then Hegel wields that also against Kant's practical philosophy to allege that, well, the categorical imperative is guilty of the empty formalism objection, which mm -hmm. is the very famous objection. That just due to Kant's conception of metaphysics as a study of the, the principles of experience, or in the practical domain, the principles of practical cognition, um, we have this very empty structure, which is detached, unmoored from um, content, uh, and it, it can't actually supply us with, with genuine knowledge. Which is the, you know, the empty formalism objection when it comes to, to practical philosophy is that the categorical imperative can be given whatever content you'd like, and it can issue with false positives and false negatives um, as a kind of test of, of moral maxims. So you know, that objection is wielded against both Kant's theoretical account of experience and his um, practical account of moral cognition. Um, that's basically the, um, the allegation of formalism against Kant. Okay. Okay. Did you did you want to continue your train of thought from earlier, John? Um. Well, I want to hear more about your thoughts, Andrew. Um. Because this is, I think, this is a, this is an important objection to Kant's theoretical philosophy. This idea that his, what he calls an analytic of the understanding as a replacement for ontology is something that ends up being empty. That it doesn't actually have any content unless we add in this thing which is completely uh, opaque to any kind of philosophical analysis, this contribution of sensibility. I think that is an important objection for for Kant and, and Kant, anyone who accepts the Kantian system to deal with. So I'm curious to hear more about how, what for, how you think that that emptiness uh, plays out or, or sort of what, I guess, maybe a more specific 
uh, statement about like what is missing when the when when the account of what being is or what an object is is empty in the way in 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 the way that you're suggesting. So maybe a clear way to ask this question is: What do you think a an ontology that doesn't that isn't empty in this way would look like? What what, what do you think that would what do you think is missing from the Kantian theoretical philosophy, basically? Sure. So <clears throat> I'm not familiar enough to, to really give a full-throated defense of, of Hegel on this front. <clears throat> My understanding is that Hegel's one of Hegel's primary criticisms of Kant's empty formalism, or supposed empty formalism, is that the division between form and content, between thought and being for Kant, is too, is too radical, and that in fact, Hegel's thesis of the identity of thought and being um, implies a much closer relationship, an indivisible relationship between form and content. But Hegel's conception of uh, thought and being as identical mm. is supposed to somehow heal this division between the understanding and sensibility. Um, and that um, Hegel kind of resurrects uh, quasi Aristotelian conception of, of being. Um, where yeah. uh, well, their being is ultimately empty, and you know that would be. If we want to get into the distinctions between you know these kind of German idealist and then classical metaphysics responses, I think um, yeah. you know someone in someone like Thomas Aquinas would deny the the notion that pure being is just an, um, an empty highest genus or something, and certainly Aristotle would deny being is the highest genus. But right. Hegel develops uh, dialectically this notion of being become progressively richer um, in a way where thought does have access to being as such, but being as such um, is also just something other than their presence for thought. Um, or I should say it's something other than the presence of something like a thing in itself yeah. for thought. Um, it's kind of the, the presence of thought to itself. I think that that's one path forward. Another path would be, you know, something like the the Thomistic um, alternative, which um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example of like a, a, a scholar on Aquinas who's a strong critic of Kant's. Attencio Son is is one example, although I'm not as familiar with him. But Cornelio Fabro has a very good essay um, that's criticizing Heidegger and Kant. I think it's um, the, the transcendentality of um, N. So the thing like that, the ground of metaphysics. Um, and in that essay, he goes through a lengthy criticism of, of Heidegger, Kant, and Hegel on the notion of being. Um, and his claims that the, the primary datum of experience as N already contains within itself um, uh, a form content distinction and also a, uh, a distinction between um, essence and existence. But that we are not given in thought um, the essences of things were given ends, um, where ends is the unity of essence and existence. So already, um, thought is parasitic upon um, essence, or sorry, um, essay, uh, that is to say, um, act or existence um, as kind of transcendental grounds of thought. Um, so I, I think that might be one way in which you could kind of heal this division through a, a revival of classical realism. Um, but it's not to yeah, it's not the sort of thing where I, I can really give a, a lengthy defense of, of the Thomist alternative, but I think that that would kind of be like the path out of Kantianism. Yeah, that points in an interesting direction. I'm, I'm, do you have the, maybe I'll ask you afterwards for the name of the, the, name of the paper again. That sounds, I, that sounds worth reading. Sure, I can, um, I can actually look it up right now. Um, oh, sure, yeah. It's um it's Cornelio Fabro is the author and the paper is titled The Transcendentality of N's Essay in the Ground of Metaphysics. Um, I found that to be a very helpful paper. Um, yeah, I'll check that out. That sounds that sounds worthwhile. Yeah, I'm interested in these Thomistic critiques of Kant um, since I, I, my understanding of Kant is as doing something very similar to. Scholasticism in certain ways, especially the way in which hylomorphism uh, plays a huge role in Kant's transcendental philosophy. But then, of course, going rejecting some central features of scholastic metaphysics. So, scholastic critiques, especially Thomistic ones, I find quite interesting. 
I'll check that out. Thanks for the recommendation. So if I'm, yeah, I think I'm... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, on um, Kant's critique of, of scholasticism or his, his similarities and differences, I think that this kind of mirrors the historical reception of Kant um, and of German idealism, so these are kind of secularized um, Christian philosophers. So that's kind of the political and cultural project that they're forwarding. Mm -hmm. and there is a sense in which Kant is kind of resurrecting the, um, the practical philosophy of um, classical natural law, and he's resurrecting kind of um, Aristotelian or hylomorphic um, conception of natural science and of, of experience, but he's doing so all on a, a very radically different and in modern um, foundation of metaphysics. So you, you get all of this stuff, but without the theology of scholasticism, you get a very different um, uh, metaphysics and a very different theological outlook. Yeah, it's a very different kind of natural law theory where the, the autonomous agent is the legislator, not, not God. So what I was gonna um, hold on, let me recapitulate my thought. Yeah, so w what you seem to be gesturing towards is um, they're basically saying that there's a division between receptivity and spontaneity, and the intelligible and the sensible form and content, um, and basically maybe even matter and form if we were to use an Aristotelian uh, hylomorphic account. Um, and it's interesting because the later German idealists, especially, I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar with Schelling, basically do attempt to sort of unify um, subject and object in a, in a sort of unison together um, and sort of recapture this sort of hylomorphic view that we can't separate content from form or matter from form seems as though every time that we talk about the world or objects, right, they always seem to already have a form sort of prepackaged into them. And that kind of reminds me, and I don't know too much about this view, of, well, I, I know some, some of it since I'm sort of reading about it, but this kind of reminds me of a sort of McDowellian view as well, um, in the sense that we're reintroducing sort of conceptual content uh, back into the world itself. So it's not just that content exists, it's that, that it's conceptual content. And some, for some people, that's very odd, right? That type of naturalized Platonism uh, or that hylomorphic account, I basically think that's going back into the world. Is that somewhere where you would, you, would, you would take yourself at? Do you find yourself, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John McDowell, agreeing with a form of like naturalized Platonism or? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a kind of account of, of the nature of experience, as, as an epistemological project, yeah, I thought McDowell's Mind and World and kind of that um, entire uh, tradition uh, is, is very interesting and I'm sympathetic to it. Yeah. Yeah, there yeah. seems to be there seems to be something right about McDowell, sort of McDowell, something about McDowellian metaphysics, although I've, I've seen a lot of as you can imagine, this like this debate just kind of continuing forever between um, being a non-conceptualist about content in the world and then being a conceptualist about content in the world, and that is a sort of back and forth between the Hegelians and Kantians. That that dilemma just does not seem to uh, does not seem to be easily resolvable. I uh, I think uh, John actually is very committed to non-conceptualism about content, or at least somewhat. Right, John? You think that that part yeah version. Of yeah, I don't want to get into it today too much. Yeah, the the. What do you the, think? Yeah, go go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to ask, like, who do you think is kind of the foremost representative of non-conceptualism about content? Um, as far as content, Robert Hanna, maybe, but. Um, yeah, he yeah, he's a bit of a weird guy, but yeah, he he definitely is one of the people who's written the most on it. I would say, um, but Elias also defends a kind of non-conceptualism. Um, which I think is quite compelling. Um, and especially because, oh, I'm trying to think actually how to compare it with Hannah's view, um, but certainly her view recognizes a kind of dependence on conceptualization in the non-conceptual content of, of intuitions, simply because, because the unity of intuitions, which is sort of a necessary condition of them having any content, is dependent on the unity of the understanding, so on the unity that concepts provide. It's just that it's indeterminate which concept is providing the unity of the intuition. And so in that way, I think uh, Elias has a pretty, a pretty strong notion of 
non-conceptualism, which nicely accommodates in certain ways these McDowellian worries, because you know he's always worried about you know sensibility providing only exculpations, not justifications of our use of concepts, um, and so he's concerned for there to be some kind of dependence on concepts or at least conceptualizability uh, when it comes to talking about any content uh, of either perception or experience or anything like that. Um, and this, I think, nicely addresses that in certain ways, although it take a while to get into, I guess. But it's it's a good, especially if you like the rest of her take on Kant, it's, there's some good papers on that. Um, sorry, someone's saying something in the chat. We're probably going to take questions later on. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, so um, are you also sympathetic? Uh, th these are some ideas that I've been getting into with respect to, you know, um, some of the non-conceptual conceptual, conceptual um, dichotomy. Um, I guess since you're a Thomistic, you have to sort of be sympathetic to it. Basically making, say, when, when it comes to the third critique, um, reestablishing normativity back into the world, um, especially within the living organism. Um, so basically, you know, reinstating teleology into uh, into how organisms work, that there is a way that organisms ought to work, uh, and there's, you know, standards in which the world seems to operate. Uh, is that something you're also sympathetic to, basically? Yeah, yeah, my, my dissertation is basically about why that's that's necessary to kind of read backwards into groundwork in the second critique to understand Kant's moral philosophy. Okay. Uh, you don't get some really moral philosophy. Theology. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. The natural to the necessary to understand Kant's uh, philosophy. Yeah, I'm kind of curious in uh, how that's going. So, I mean, I I guess that's a pretty good entry point into you know we've been talking somewhat about the theoretical. So we'll we'll move into the uh, practical philosophy. Something you might you might be a little bit more comfortable about right here. So, um, you know, I guess for the audience, since um, I don't know how many of them are going to be familiar with. Kant's practical philosophy, just kind of building uh, a scheme of how all that works, what's what's uh, what's basically going on there, um, and then kind of move us into where you're working towards and what your idea of all these things are. Sure, yeah. So um, in the same way that in Kant's theoretical philosophy, he's interested in, in um, providing a, a critical metaphysics uh, uh, experience. And he understands metaphysics as the science of the uh, basic principles of the constitution of experience. He, he shifts in the, the practical domain, domain to providing a, um, a metaphysics of moral cognition or a metaphysics of the good, um, which is why he provides first a groundwork of the metaphysics of morals and then a metaphysics of morals. Um, so Kant's moral philosophy is aiming at providing those, those basic principles of moral cognition. Um, so he begins the groundwork with um, a look at you know the only thing that is good in itself is a good will and then he slowly unpacks in the first section of the groundwork uh, what a good will must consist in and it ultimately unfolds into um, the notion of universal lawfulness as such and he develops this as the, the principle of the moral law um the, the categorical imperative which has various formulations um, and the the categorical imperative um, is supposed to be simultaneously it's the, the form of the of practical reason it's universal lawfulness, and for that reason, it's also the uh, the determining ground of our of a moral goodwill. Um, so the big controversies in Kant's moral philosophy um, is one: what is the categorical imperative supposed to be doing? What is the form of practical reason um, supposed to achieve within this kind of architectonic? Um, is it supposed to just be um, a kind of like uh, an explanation of? Uh, what occurs in moral reasoning, or is it supposed to be a kind of decision procedure to issue in kind of concrete positive duties? Um, that's kind of the Rawlsian and Course Guardian view. It's a very ambitious view of what the categorical imperative is supposed to achieve. Um, and then, can it second? Can it actually achieve that task? Um, can it actually issue in, in concrete duties? We already discussed kind of Hegel's objection of empty formalism. It's one of the main reasons why people think that Kant's moral philosophy ends up being of impotent um, as, a, as a guide to moral reasoning. Um, so my project um, is to do, um, my, my project is to kind of reread um, Kant's uh, moral philosophy in such a way that 
uh, the empty formalism objection kind of fades away. The Kant um, relates reason and nature um, together uh, in the, the second critique and ultimately in the third critique in such a way that he really does supply the categorical imperative with definite content. Um, uh, so that's kind of my project and what <laughs> Kant conceived of the project of moral philosophy is involving. So, so yeah, go, go ahead, John, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so what role do you think that Kant's appeals to the highest good are going to play in, in sketching out that picture? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the typic a little bit, but you know, in general, his appeals to the higher, highest good. Yeah, so one uh, appeals to the highest good play a role in Kant's theory of moral motivation. Um, so there are kind of two, um, two kind of parallel um, pillars of this project. There's a theory of moral motivation, what the, the, the determining grounds of the goodwill, and then there's also a theory of moral reasoning. Um, the, the, the highest good is simultaneously something that um, you, you know, must be posited as a, as a regular principle in order to be a determining grounds of our will. Um, this is Kant's argument for immortality and a judging God, mm -hmm. um, which he, he develops into a very robust theory of the highest good in the third critique. Um, and, and second, it's also the, the object of uh, practical reason, the, the formal object of practical reason, that it's mm -hmm. something that we, we um, that a, a goodwill must aim for um, as the highest good. And he conceives the highest good as a kind of integration of the realms of reason and nature in the, in the third critique. Um, so, kind of as the uh, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the determining grounds and the the object, the formal object of practical reasoning, highest good is um, kind of bookends of Kant's practical uh, philosophy. So, would you say that the emptiness that Hegel accuses Kant of having in his ethical in his practical philosophy is avoided precisely by filling it, as it were, with this no with the, this notion of the highest good as the formal object of of the will um or would you not put it that way i i usually wouldn't put it that way but that i mean that is an interesting way to put it um i think the highest good does have a role in in answering the, the empty formalism objection that for one thing you know it's an open question whether you can answer the empty formalism objection in the practical domain without also understanding that it's a critique of kant's supposed formalism in the theoretical domain and is kant actually guilty of that that formalism because of course he is a kind of philomorphist right yeah. um experience is always parasitic upon a matter of experience. Um, but then I think the Kant's conception of the highest good is ultimately intelligible only given Kant's conception, which is very little mentioned in the literature of a moral world. He has this view that the world of experience, of theoretical experience, nature, has to be viewed from the perspective of practical reason as governed by purposive laws. Um, and I think that that's you know, a core part of why does Kant give this additional formulation of form of the universal law? Why does he say a formula, the universal law of nature's formulation? Um, uh, well, I think it's because he has in the background this conception of a moral world, um, the view that nature itself is supplying the categorical imperative with definite content. Nature is a, a unity or a harmonious system of purposive laws. So I think it's that's why Kant's moral philosophy ultimately depends upon his metaphysics of nature and his um, teleology, so his view of natural teleology. That, that's subsumed, of course, in his conception of the highest good, because the highest good is a unity of nature and reason, yeah. unity of nature and freedom. But it's uh, the notion of a moral world that's doing the work there. OK, interesting. Uh, so. Just a, I guess a quick question. Um, I mean, I, I like the picture that's being painted between uh, sort of the analogy between uh, practical ethics and teleology in general. And then we could sort of ask the same, or we could, we could sort of see, if I'm understanding you correctly, and, and correct me if I'm not, that in the way that reason sort of makes a demand upon us, or practical reason sort of makes a demand upon us to make certain types of ethical actions, you're instead going to say that in a way nature, right, is going to make that same type of demand. Um, and so there's a sort of normativity associated back within nature that puts a demand upon us. Is that, is that, do I have that right? 
I, I think Kant is still very strongly committed to the, the view that practical reason is autonomous, that we, we are self-legislating, um, or that practical reason is uh, self-legislating. Um, and so we are, in a sense, binding ourselves through our rational faculties to the moral law. Sure. Um, it's not that uh, nature, uh, devoid of reason, is binding us to the moral law. Um, rather, the notion of a moral world is a kind of, you know, in the typic of practical judgment, this becomes very important, is, Kant thinks, a key step for the sensible depiction of the moral law. The, the, the moral law itself is an idea of, of practical reason, and Kant is clear in the first critique that you know, ideas um, are never uh, schematized, they, they're never provided um, a, a full concrete instantiation within the realm of experience. They're always um, you know, ideals that are beyond the realm of experience that are posited by faculty of reason. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, because um, practical cognition concerns the ways in which reason makes its object actual within the world, he understands practical morals as freedom realizing its object within the realm of experience, um, if the object of um, goodwill is, in a sense, the moral law, it is um, goodness as such, uh, the moral law has to be provided a sensible depiction uh, within the realm of experience. And that's the role of the typic of practical judgment, um, where Kant has this view that we have to view nature as a whole under the perspective of practical reason. Uh, as though it were teleologically organized. Um, and that's why nature comes to have kind of life breathed back into it. It comes to have normative content at this very definite stage in Kant's moral reasoning, um, the typic where moral law is given a sensible depiction. So it's still us binding ourselves in a certain sense. I mean, I don't like when people talk as though moral law is some kind of contract where this is a very constructivist view. Um, it's practical reason binding itself. Okay. And that cause transcendental idealism, the reason why you can't decouple the transcendental idealism from the practical yeah. philosophy is because you view nature as a product of, of uh, practical reason. Right. Sorry if that was rambling. No, 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 no. Huh? That's, that's exactly, yeah. You, you had something, John? Yeah, I was just, no, just going to add to that. Yeah, the moral world is the notion of, or the, maybe even the image of, a law-governed world in which we contribute some of the laws, or practical reason contributes some of the laws. Um, specifically the laws that govern the, the operation of all the rational beings in that in that world. And then everything else is governed by other laws, which we don't contribute except by way of recognition. So, but the question I guess I, I still have is, um, you, but you seem to be rejecting Kant's notion of autonomy and self-legislation so where do these laws then come from if not nature i mean are, are, are you are you like subscribing to a form of divine command theory i mean what do you have as a sort of substitute for that um and why would we be committed to these um moral oughts if they're sort of external to us what would motivate us um to be binded to them um because, you know, in Kant's philosophy, there's an easy sort of sense of why they're motivating. They're just constitutive of our rationality, right? We're self-legislating, but if you're placing these sorts of moral oughts outside of ourselves, um, like, a, like a rationalist might, or, I don't know, um, just whatever, like, robust moral realist uh, is committed to, how, how do these begin to motivate us, and how does that all sort of occur? Um, un unless I'm still misunderstanding something about you might having some aspects of Kantian ties there. You mean um, my, you, you don't mean my reading of Kant, but my kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. non-academic act. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still very sympathetic to many elements of um, Kant's practical philosophy. So I, I do think that, you know, even on a, a Thomistic view of natural law um, or a, you know, Thomistic theology, um, what sort of God um, do you end up having a Thomistic view. Well, in a way similar to uh, kind of the Hegelian God, you know, they're both Aristotelian conceptions of, of theology, where they're both the act of thought thinking itself, um, and that has a kind of like formal lawfulness that, to, that should be intelligible and transparent to us. Um, so I think that the, uh, the Thomistic view of, of natural law ends up resembling Kant's practical philosophy in many ways. You know, um, nature is a kind of lawfully organized, purposive unity. Um, 
for these these purposes, you know, on the Kantian view, you, you view them um, these principles of regulative judgment, the view that God, you have a creator God organizing the world purposively. On the Thomistic view, it's not. It's a uh, you know, it actually does tell you about the, the constitution of uh, of reality. You have this constitutive view of, of purposiveness, but on, on both views, you know, it, it's ultimately a kind of cosmic reason um, in which you are a participant that's governing um, the world. It's it's your own um, pure practical reason. You know, for Kant, God just becomes pure practical reason, at least it seems. And on the uh, the Thomistic or kind of classical theist view, it seems like we're not that far away from that, um, where uh, you have God as the act of thought, thinking itself as you know the pure form of the good. Um, it constructs the world along these lines, um, and it is kind of cosmic reason in which both you and God are participating that renders the natural law intelligible to you. Yeah. I think that yeah, they relevantly parallel. Yeah, I, I can kind of see the parallel, but this begins to get into, uh, um, and this is where I sort of, I guess, end up, end up seeing this project ending, um, which is always, you know, so, sort of surprising while I talk to Thomistics about it or Aristotelians, um, is that if you're placing, if you're, if, if you're continuing that project, it seems like it gets you into a form of panantheism, not, not pantheism, or pa but panantheism. Uh, which is what I ultimately think that Hegel kind of commits you to. Um, as I recall, and when you're, um, and not, I don't know too much about this, but um, when you were talking on reason and theology, you seem to uh, at least be aware that Hegel is sort of committed to this sort of ontological argument, a big ontological argument that his entire system is trying to fulfill. Um, that's trying to prove, I think, a, a form of panantheism instead of. Um, instead of a, a classic theistic account. So I guess one of the other questions that I wanted to ask you is like, what, what, what exactly do you have working against a panantheistic account? What, why are you sort of unsatisfied with it? Or are you satisfied with it and, you know, just don't know where to take it or? Yeah, uh, panantheism is a kind of a constant uh, seduction for a Thomist, um, I think that so there's kind of first of all the question of you know, how far away from panentheism is classical theism or is Thomas Aquinas uh, because you do have this kind of metaphysics of participation uh, you do have the identity of God with the the pure subsistent act of being itself um, and all created things are kind of finite contractions of this pure subsistent act of being so I think in classical theism you don't have the, uh, the bad infinite Hegel criticizes um, contemporary theology for where you have um, the uh, the abstract infinite on the one hand, then you have finite created things on the other, and there's kind of no relation between them. Um, you can see how this kind of relates to, to early modern Protestantism, this view of the, uh, the total depravity of, of that which is utterly separate uh, and apart from God, and then a God who's kind of an inscrutable Deus Absconditus on the other hand, that's just unintelligible to our reason. And I don't think that's the classical theist view. And if um, something apart from that is panentheistic or resembles panentheism. I don't think that's a mistake. I think that Aquinas actually does kind of resemble that view. The real problem with Hegel's panentheism is he seems to embrace um, a kind of univocal conception of being, um, yeah. where the, the being of God is, yeah, the being of God and the being of created things is that very same being. Right. Um, that and. Um, that Aquinas, on the other hand, his analogical conception of being introduces at least some distance here. That the, the, the two doctrines of participation are very different. What I uh, mentioned earlier is I think this might have a lot to do with the difference between Hegel's conception of pure being in the opening of the logic as pure being, reines sein, is empty being. Yes. Um, yes. And you need to develop it, uh, which is why he has a kind of uh, developing conception of God um, who also yeah. becomes a self conscious it's a, world. It's, it's a very attractive view, though. I mean, um, there's uh, there is a book actually. I can't remember who it's by. Uh, called the Problem of Omnipotence. Actually, so you have sort of certain types of conceptions, panentheistic conceptions of God, sort of growing, if you will, um, uh, not necessarily being at the peak of you know, comp not necessarily filling the you know the four O's that we generally attribute to the classic uh, theistic conception and seems more right to me that, you know, there's a certain development in, in God of where, you know, to, to use a sort of cliche phrase is uh, building himself through us and, you know, we're building himself through him in that sort of um, relational 
uh, theodicy. So, but anyways, I didn't mean to. Oh, even there. No, uh, I was going to say even there, I think Hegel's closer to the the classical theist view because his notion of the self consciousness of God. My understanding, I'm not an expert in Hegel's theology, is that this is completed within the imminent Trinity. Um, that God, you have um, immediacy um, in the Father, and then um, the realm of nature within the Son, um, and then the the return to spirit and self consciousness in the spirit. Um, so that within the imminent Trinity, you have God's um, self consciousness. And then that self-consciousness is then reenacted in the course of creation where human beings have the same triadic structure of, of their self-consciousness, um, where they are in the process of um, philosophy, you know, coming to, to cognition of, of absolute spirit. Um, so the philosophy being the culmination of, of theology, which is why Hegel thinks that Christianity is not just a religion, a, a symbolic form of knowledge, but that it is uh, pure philosophy itself um, because it is coming to be aware of. Uh, the trinitarian god um, so i think that in a certain way even that is closer to the classical theist view um, where god's development does assume this triadic structure but it's within the imminent trinity um, i don't i don't think that hegel's ultimately committed to the the view that god is um developing in the sense that would de deny immutability um, that there's a transcendent god for hegel is the the imminent trinity I see. Yeah, that would be a little bit where I would get uh, sort of lost on that idea. Um, I'm not really, yeah, whenever I do read any works about the sort of panentheism involved in Schelling and Hegel, it does seem to me that it's developmental, but I, I might just not be too too keen on that. Uh, before, I, before we continue this, John, I know you have to leave here pretty soon. Did you want to ask any sort of final questions before you head out or how are you looking at time do you have to do you have to head out here pretty soon yeah i should get going but i just want to say thank you so much for this conversation Andrew. that was really interesting i don't know very much hegel so that last bit was a very informative <laughs> for me um but i it was good 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 chat thanks for, thanks for talking yeah. yeah um hold have on a good one enjoy the rest of the chat yeah, have a have a good one for now, John. Uh, thanks for coming uh, on as well. Uh, it's always it's always a pleasure having you, especially if you know, uh, sort of uh, defending me and my lack of uh, Kantian knowledge, since uh, you're definitely more uh, studied on that. So, I know the pleasure's mine. Enjoy this. Okay. Um. Okay. Sorry. John's a good guy. He's uh he's he's by far one of the best Kantian um readers that I've ever encountered. But um. Where where was I? Yeah, I mean, I I'm I'm sort of really sympathetic to this idea, um, kind of de deviating from practical philosophy. I still wanted to ask a few questions there, but I'm very sympathetic to this sort of panentheist idea. I've been actually thinking about talking to Joshua Rasmussen, who's in the philosophy of religion, to see how um you know how how panentheism is taking in terms of reception within modern academic philosophy because it seems to be largely ignored right we don't we generally don't talk about thinkers like spinoza um and it's and it's sort of debated whether he was a pantheist or a panentheist or a hegel or Schelling and their conceptions of god but if you read Schelling, he has a, he has a lot to sort of say on the idea that uh, he thinks that and this is sort of what i am starting to be incredibly sympathetic to he has this line, maybe you know it, um, he says something like, nature is invisible spirit and, in, you know, and uh, spirit is visible nature, basically, or invisible, yeah, sorry, I had, the, I had them inverted, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Nature is visible spirit and, um, sp uh, and spirit is invisible nature. Um, so there is a sense of where he basically wants to tie form and matter back together, um, form and content back together, and sort of the formal aspects become the normativity of nature, the teleological structure, or the purposefulness of nature itself. And some of the things that I've been talking to about John is basically trying to reinstate the notion of Kant's community, which I think Schelling does, into biological organisms and reintroduce this sort of top-down structure um, into our notion of causation itself. So um, I'm not sure if you read people like M Michael Thompson or John, John Dupree, um, 
especially John Dupree or someone like Stephen Mumford talking about causation. I think they have a very nice conception, you know, say just even biological cells, if they're cut off from a body, seem to functionally act differently than if they, say, are attached to a human body. What functional difference is there? Well, in, in terms of generally regulating things like metabolism and homeostasis and things like that. And that seems to be a top-down function to me instead of a bottom-up function, sort of reintroducing um, normativity in that lens. And I don't know how far I want to apply that, but it seems if you're very sympathetic to that type of normativity, reintroducing that to the entire cosmos itself um, as a sort of, um, what's, the, what's the Kantian phrase? Um, exhibiting, a, I guess, a unity or uniformity of nature. Yeah, um, yeah Michael Thompson's uh, character, he's a fun guy. But um, I, I do think, yeah, their, their accounts of kind of like causal holism, it's kind of like um, you know, new organicism of some sort is, is, is very appealing. I mean, my own um, path to like reinterest in um, philosophy of religion began with an interest in Stoic philosophy. I was very interested in um, classical Stoicism. I mean, the Stoic theology does view all of um, cosmos as a kind of um, uh, you know, cosmic animal or, or organism. Yeah. Um, so there are the pantheists uh, or panentheists. I think most people say the Stoics are kind of a paradigmatic pantheistic philosophy. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess the view, the difficulty uh, is, what does it take to be a, a substantial whole then, where the whole exercises some sort of structural um, organizing purposiveness and guiding the, the causal structures of the parts? Um, you know, we, we can apprehend that a um, you know, particular organism, a particular life form, exhibits um, uh, 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 structural holism that influences the parts, and the parts are such that they're ordered for the sake of the whole. Um, and we, we understand the kind of imminent proposedness in that. Um, but then if we kind of group together any arbitrary aggregate of items, um, you know, they do exercise certain causal powers on one another. And we can even say that as a system, they exercise causal powers um, over each of them individually. Um, for example, like gravitational force or whatever. Right. But we probably wouldn't want to say that that is an organism in the same way that um, a particular animal body is an organism. There has to be some sort of substantial unity exhibited in the one case that's not in the other sure yeah um, it seems like the the cosmos itself i mean it's difficult to see if it's one or the other or somewhere in between it does have laws that are um exercised over you know the entirety of the cosmos that only become intelligible through the notion of a, of a unified whole mm. um, but it also doesn't seem to have the uh, or exhibit the sort of unity that, for instance an, or an ordinary animal sure perhaps. yeah I think, you know, with animals and organisms and with human beings, you're going to have to introduce notions of um, propositional attitudes, certain types of intentional states. Um, I mean, I'm okay with normativity being in nature, but I'm not sure if that's the same thing as intentional states, say, um, that an animal might have. I'm not quite sure whether I would have intentional states into certain types of things like trees or not. Um, it's very hard to find out exactly where intention ends or where even consciousness begins. Um, because I'm not really sure what the, the sort of material equivalent to consciousness would be. Like when, when, when is it exactly that consciousness arises from certain types of material conditions being in a certain type of combination with, it, with itself? Um, and I'm, I'm kind of progressively thinking that the brain is actually not going to be responsible for um, the idea of consciousness being uh, an emergent property just strictly from that because you know you can look at certain things like jellyfish or uh, starfish and they seem to be displaying some level of intentionality and they have no brain um, and then you have obviously uh, certain types of patients who are missing a large majority of their brain uh, you can lose your brain stem you can lose um, your entire uh, entire top of your your brain and still have certain levels of consciousness there um 
So yeah, drawing a yeah, I, I definitely agree that drawing a a distinction between animals, organisms, and the rest of of nature in terms of its normativity is definitely needed. And there's certain there are certainly like emergent properties there. Uh, but I, I yeah yeah I mean I don't, I'm not sure how much more I have to say on that. So there there was one question that I wanted to uh, go back to on the practical on the on the practical philosophy. I, I'm still a little bit uh, confused, and I guess it's because I probably know the least amount when it comes to practical philosophy with respect to Kant. Is um, so so your picture exactly? I'm still unsure exactly where the demand is supposed to come from. Are you saying that our reason is in some way, like in a sort of Spinozian sense, um, linked in with God and the rest of nature, or to where? nature and our mind have some sort of reason giving um yeah some some something reason giving in order for us to i guess follow those aughts it's probably worded in an awkward way but maybe you get what i'm trying to say i i think i um i understand the um the thought here i think the con just not quite saying that that that's something that's closer to like the stoic view, right so the stoic view of natural law is you have we are finite rational creatures and then there is um the kind of infinite reason cosmic reason of god and god created the world in such a way that it exhibits these natural laws which are really just um you know the reason of god and that's transparent to us because we participate in god's cosmic reason right um, that's yeah. kind of the natural law and the question is is kant saying basically the same thing where you have finite reason on the one hand infinite reason on the other and they're structurally parallel in such a way um that there's some sort of normative relation or something like that. Um, if that's the a fair characterization of your thought here. Yeah, um, I, I, well, I, I know Kant's not quite doing that. I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering if you see parallels between Kant to where it can accommodate that type of stoic picture that you have set up right there, or say a Hegelian or Schellingian or Spinozian sort of system. What I'm asking is, is how would you take what you can from Kant and apply it to your own particular ethical system, say in Thomism, or um, if there are any similarities or whatever at all that you could even do that with. Yeah, so, so kind of two points. Um, one, the, the main reason why Kant's not doing that, I think, is that um, the, the God plays a kind of instrumental role for his moral reasoning. It's not that he, and you're aware of this, it's not that he begins with cosmic reason and then has kind of natural or has a kind of divine command theory and then the question arises well like how does this relate to human autonomy why are these divine commands um normatively binding on us rather the argument is we begin with the conception of pure practical reason as self-legislating um where its normativity is kind of a given um at the, the foundations of his moral philosophy and then we get to the point where pure practical reason has to be provided with a sensible depiction um in uh the view of a moral world and that Kant uh, introduces the notion of kind of creative pra pure practical reason, God as a designer of teleological structures, in order to supply the visible world with that, um, in order to provide, provide the moral law with a sensible depiction in the visible world. So God is introduced kind of at the end of Kant's moral thought as a guarantor or kind of regulative principle to order our um, moral reasoning. Um, now, when it comes to what this has to do with to mystic thought, I mean, I don't think that you really have to appeal. Um, I, I think it's more that Kant ends up justifying a somewhat similar view, rather than that Kant can really inform to mystic natural law. Mm -hmm. um, they, they end up kind of curiously looking similar, which is not surprising given that Kant is coming from this German scholastic tradition and was, by all accounts, you know, fairly morally conventional in all of his attitudes on controversies of the day. So the fact that he ends up justifying a more or less conventional natural law attitude shared with Thomism, it's not surprising. Um, but they obviously had two very different paths to get there. Um, I think that's, I mean, the question of uh, autonomy about the relationship between divine and human reason on the Thomistic view is an interesting question. I don't think it takes quite the same path Kant's account of the moral law does. I guess that that kind of answers the two separate points. One, um, what gives, why does Kant introduce this theology at all? 
to how similar is it to the Thomistic view? Okay. So you, you, you do think that, okay, so if I understand you correctly, and I'll just try to repeat this, um, that God does play some sort of role within Kant's philosophy. It's a sort of underlying, maybe super sensible role. Um, is it supposed to be responsible for the creation of the noumenal subject and practical reason? And that is in some way supposed to be derivative from God, but just kind of unknowable? Is it supposed to be implicit in that sort of sense, but ultimately unknowable? I think when it comes to uh, what role does a creator of God play in Kant's um, kind of speculative religion, that's something that pure reason is not going to be able to, to answer. So are we created by, um, by God you know, at a specific moment in time? What is the nature of this this God? Um, that's the sort of thing where I think Kant, by um, you know denying knowledge to make room for faith, he's walling that off and saying that's the wrong with positive theology. Um, you know, he has this essay on the conflict of the faculties. Philosophy is not going inter to intervene in that sphere of, of positive theology. It's only known through revelation. I don't want to talk about it, which in some ways is why Kant is actually a very conventional Lutheran, um, because he thinks that this is not the the proper domain of philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, it comes to like why does Kant introduce God at certain stages in his philosophy? I think it's um, I don't want to say it's an afterthought, but it's a very it's a very late step. Where um, God as a as the transcendental ideal is supposed to somehow organize as a regulative principle some domain of knowledge. The, the theoretical domain you have to introduce God at the end, um, at least so that we can think the world as though it were a purposive unity. Um, that exhibits the properties of design um, in order to make scientific investigation possible. We have to think the world as though it were created by God, even though reason can provide no guarantee that there is a God um, that created the world. You know, we don't have speculative metaphysics. Um, uh, we, we can't investigate through speculative metaphysics into the, the existence of God. Um, in the practical domain, we have basically the same thing, where God is a kind of late stage principle guarantees our investigation into the, the moral constitution of nature. I, we don't know that God exists. Um, it's not a proof of God. It's not that God is doing kind of independent work of binding our, our moral reasoning. Um, he's just a kind of ideal that's organizing and completing our moral reasoning, making moral reasoning actually a kind of complete system, something that's uh, uh, finally possible. If that makes sense, that's kind of his view. Yeah, it, it, it's it's slowly becoming a little bit more uh, sensical to me. I mean, I've read the third critique. I do know that he basically relegates teleology to be something re regulative, sort of purposefulness without purpose. Um, so the idea is that the only way that we can understand the world is through teleology, even though it's not going to be necessarily constitutive of the world itself. Um, it's just going to be as you sort of said earlier, I guess a, a formal principle in order to understand the world, and you could sort of object to that as a with the formal, um, with the sort of empty formalism objection. I guess that's that's where I sort of want to hit um, the conversation next. Do you think you have a sort of way of assaulting Kant in terms of that um, that view that we can only use teleological arguments in a regulative sort of way? Or do you think like the only way of um, attacking that is just to abandon transcendental metaphysics altogether? I think you'd have to abandon transcendental idealism, at least, to, to attack that point of view. Um, so you can either take that in one of two directions. One, the, the kind of Hegelian route, where um, there's just no distinction between thought and being anymore. The way in which we have to think the world is the way the world actually is. These teleological structures are exhibited in the world precisely because we cannot think the world other than teleologically. Um, um, you can take a kind of Thomistic route, which is ultimately aiming at roughly the same thing, a denial between the distinction between thought and being, um, although on non-idealist grounds. Um, either of those routes would involve attacking kind of the fundamental presuppositions of Kant's philosophy. Um, how do we enter into philosophy? Do we start with epistemology and then question the possibility of metaphysics or epistemology and metaphysics kind of simultaneous disciplines? 
and that would be the kind of like mystic alternative or to mystic criticism mm -hmm. uh, do we affirm this form content matter form distinction very strongly or do we um, do we not kind of hegelian criticism mm -hmm. um, both of these are kind of uh ways of avoiding the the kantian uh, relegation of teleology to um a merely regulative status. But I think within Kant's own system of transcendental idealism, you're going to get regulative theology. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So I, I get it. So it's just a, it's just, a, it's just what you're sort of suspicious again is going back to the things that we we're talking about earlier. That's why you sort of mentioned, I guess, uh, Hegel's science of logic. Because what one thing that Hegel does is um, sort of abandon the idea of starting with transcendental arguments and sort of abandoning the idea of starting with subjectivity or necessarily in a type of experience that's going to be individuated towards the subject um, and rather start in this sort of abyss, right? Um, namely being qua being. Um, and for Hegel, it would be starting with indeterminate being and then seeing the sort of generative and seeing the sort of generative properties of being sort of imminently unfold itself dialectically, you know, the movement into being to nothing, um, and then that creating the sort of concept of becoming, and then becoming eventually sort of oscillating uh, or ossifying, uh, being in nothing, right, in terms of its determinate being and nothing, and then just sort of dialectically building these types of concepts until we get into more nuanced um, concepts of understanding and more nuanced ways of, uh, of basically making sense of the subject, not as an isolated moment, not as a numinal subject, but something that is necessarily intertwined with other subjects and the world, right, to where the world sort of comes prior to the subject, right? If we begin with subjectivity, you can't exit subjectivity. If we begin with being, you can enter in subjectivity and you see how it's sort of actually fundamentally parasitic on, on this sort of idea. Um, is, is that about where you would kind of take that or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's obviously a very appealing strategy that instead of beginning with kind of the, the thought of a finite rational being, a finite subject kind of enclosed within itself and trying through the transcendental method to kind of work your way out of that and refute skepticism and idealism, you just begin with pure thought itself. Right. It seems to be the Hegelian. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of where I am right now. Um, although I, I do wonder if beginning with the sort of indeterminate being itself, which means abandoning the discursivity thesis, um, you know, that's that's it's it sort of becomes hard to do because then you fall into a, presumably a myth of the given. Uh, presumably, you're talking about this sort of empty non-conceptual sort of i guess even mystical beginning you know i mean hegel actually i think uses the word lossenheit in the science of logic and you get the lossenheit in a uh, in, in certain types of mystical traditions like eckhart and actually even nietzsche who basically says that you know ultimately philosophy needs to begin with emptying oneself of this sort of conceptual of these conceptual determinations and then beginning with the most indeterminate presuppositionalist philosophy that one can. And the idea is if that mystic move, uh, that sort of, I think, mystic move is even possible in the sort of first place. A lot of people that I've talked to are not very sympathetic to, you know, beginning something with like something like indeterminate being with um, within Hegel. And it even seems more strange to me when I talk to some to mystics when they talk about a dualistic conception that is between God and nature itself. I don't really get the idea of something other than being. I don't really get the idea of why would one want to abandon the univocity of being, I guess, in the first place, if you if you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I'm not prepared to give like a, a defense of the kind of Thomistic thesis of the, the analogy of being, but Yeah, I mean, I guess that is like the, the fundamental Thomistic criticism of Hegel, right? That, um, that the way that some 19th century Thomists criticized Hegel, King of, um, I think his first name, Father Pola, the professor of the Catholic University of America, he wrote kind of manual Thomist theology. 
um, criticism goes that Hegel begins with a, a conception of pure being as as uh, empty, being. Um, and then you know through the dialectical method is developing this this notion until you finally get the the concrete subject who's embedded within a world, um, just the consciousness of itself and absolute philosophy. The, the Thomistic response seems to be something like, well, be, the being that we start with um, is not your um, the being that we it begin with our initial content contact with an experience is not pure being obviously it's a finite contraction of pure being pure being on the Thomistic view is not devoid of content um, it has all possible content right um, it, it has contains every perfection maximally mm -hmm. it is the pure act of perfection itself mm -hmm. um, now my understanding is that Hegel's conception of God um, is simultaneously pure being um, and um, a fully a variegated being, right? Because he's coming to self consciousness of itself through absolute philosophy. So you both begin and end with this God of becoming. And on the, the Thomistic view, it seems to be that, well, you need two different but related notions of being. One to make sense of the, the being of ends that we encounter in concrete experience. Uh, which is an impure being with a composition. And then another, which is known through abstraction from that, which is pure being. Uh, pure being that is not devoid of content, pure being, which is infinite being. Uh, uh, and that the two are related by way of analogy. Um, but there's a, a distinction that they're not, don't employ the concept of being univocally. The, are, you, are you more sympathetic to the... You, you, to the university of being, or are, are you really strongly committed to this sort of Catholic picture that God and nature are, are separated wholly? Um, because I just, I suppose I never saw what's really at stake in the idea of at least not reducing God to nature, because that, I mean, the pantheistic, the panentheistic sort of conception does not seem to reduce God to nature itself. It seems to obviously emphasize that there's something more to it and it seems to um, offer a type of hylomorphism seems to offer all of the sort of general metaphysical baggage that's illustrated of illustrative of <clears throat> sorry of Aristotle and maybe maybe at least in part obviously not in the whole of Thomas Aquinas so uh, it, do you just want to really really preserve that classic theistic notion or I, mean, I would say that the, the analogy of being uh, does not imply that God is wholly other than nature, which is why I think that you know the Thomistic view is closer to the Hegelian view than we sometimes I see. think. Um, you know, Aquinas' modern um, defenders would also kind of like balk at horror, horror at, at that comparison. Um, but I think the views are somewhat similar. Um, because Aquinas do, is committed to this participatory conception of creation. Um, well, we don't participate in the uh, divine essence or the divine substance. Created being does not participate in the divine essence, but it does participate in some sense in the being of God. Yeah, um, but but then yeah, sure, yeah, but then it seems really weird because, um, well, I mean, precisely in the notion that um, God is causing the world to come into being, well. Uh, Namely, this notion of causality that we're putting forward right here is going to have some sort of univocal nature between God and what he created, wouldn't you say? I mean, how does God actively participate in something completely ontologically distinct from himself? Um, how are we applying the PSR in any sort of way from the type of PSR that God seems to, the, the type of cause that God seems to be, you know, pushing the world into existence or creating it from himself or ex nihilo I don't, I don't i don't know what type of view you have and the type of causality that we see you know every every sort of every day um it seems as though if they are two different types of causalities then the cosmological argument can never get off the ground and we could never really then create this sort of you know a divide that i that i keep seeing in in um well, in a lot of contemporary arguments, in the cosmological argument. 
do you think that the, the difference in efficient causality, um, the distinction which is grounding their analogy on the Timothy view is that um, you know, efficient causality within the creative world involves um, you know, the, the action of one created substance upon another, um, whereas efficient causality, um, God's efficient causal relationship to, to creation um, is something like um, creation ex nihilo, it's the generation of um, new, a new substance or new being from nothing. Um, it's, it's not, a, it's, well, it's, it's not a case of generation and corruption, it's a case of creation. That's like the relevant distinction. You just like don't think that there's. Um, I'm just saying it just. That the, uh, it just seems like there's weak. some. It just seems like there's a necessary connection between cause and effect, where whatever is in the effect has to be, in the cause, right? And if we're saying that first cause is efficient, I, I, I'm I'm okay to, debate whether it's efficient or not. But if it is efficient, I, I guess it really doesn't matter, and they are necessarily connected. Um, it seems like they participate in some univocity. Um And I'm, I haven't read Dun Scotus, but I thought that that would have been sort of the critique that he gives of Thomas Aquinas as well. I could be wrong here because I'm not, I'm not at all read on Dun Scotus. I've also not read uh, Dun Scotus because medieval philosophy is uh, way out of my yeah, house. Yeah. But... yeah, but that would be... That would yeah, be... I, I... I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> a really quick point. Yeah, I, I guess the Thomistic reply would be something like, um, you know, that which is contained in the, the the effect, or that which is in the effect, must be in the cause, but not necessarily in the same way. Um, and you know, you could think of this analogous to to ordinary experience on the Thomistic view that um, in experience, the agent intellect um, it uh, you know abstracts uh, the form of the object. From the the object that is supplied to you, so the form is contained in your mind and in the object, but not in the same way. It's not concretely instantiated uh, in matter. Um, similarly, it, you know, some sort of distinction. Being. Well, I'm not so sure it is because anytime I think about formal principles, like say an artisan. And I'm not even sure. So, I mean, I was reading a, a really good book. I don't know if you've read this. It was um, Nature After Kant, Hegel, and uh, Aristotle. Yeah, Aristotle, Kant, and Hegel. And Winfield basically makes the um, sort of argument, well, what is sort of creation ex nihilo? Is it like an artisan creating... Is it like an artisan sort of creating a painting in which... He endows certain types of formal principles that are derivative off of the concepts that the agent employs, or is it instead a father giving life with a mother to an offspring? What's the difference is that the form that's inherent in the parents are then placed onto, right, through genetics and things like that, under the other formal principles, are then are inherited by the offspring to where the offspring is in some way taking the, the form of the, of, the, of the parents, right? Whereas the artisan is just sort of pushing a certain type of concept. And so if God is creating... Sorry, one second. Yeah. If God is creating the world, other people... Well, he's presumably doing it through his own image. I mean, pr presumably Logos is something that God has that we both have. Uh, presumably our body is going to be in some way derivative from God as sort of a father, if you, if you will. And that same form that is would be within God would also be, in, and in some sort of uni uh, univocal way, the human being as well. You see the, the sort of analogy that I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, push right here in, in towards a, a, a sort of panantheistic conception. Yeah, um, I have to think more about this. I, I guess my understanding is on the, the classical theist view, example Augustine or Aquinas or whomever else. Um, we we obviously we have our being from God, there on their view. So it's not as though the being of human beings is um, the being of creation. Is somehow somehow merely arisen from nothing. 
I mean, God as efficient cause, something wholly separate, and there's no relation of participation whatsoever. Um, there has to be some sort of participatory relation, um, which would lend its, you know, lend itself to this view that um, you know, our being and the, is somehow, some way, also the being of God. Um, uh, so does that mean that the, the two, uh, we, we speak of being univocally in either case? Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, I, I think that the, the Thomistic view would be something like, yes, we do have act. God is, is act. Um, and we have our act from the act of God. Uh, in, the, in that sense, we have a doctrine of participation. Nonetheless, the way in which we have act is fundamentally different from the way in which God is active being. Um, we are finite, um, finite created beings. These created beings have act in a way that is contingent, um, it's dependent, um, it's temporal, um, and, and God's being on the Thomistic view is, is none of these things. Um, and, and God being is not even conjoined with essence. Um, there is no composition, so he's not an ends the same way that we are. Mm. Um, so there are all sorts of relevant distinctions you might draw between the being of God and the being of finite creatures. Um, enter into the very, like God is the very essence of being itself, or not. Composite creatures where essence is conjoined with being. These are ways in which it seems that the, the act of God is somehow analogous. Other than identical. I guess some of the other sort of problems that I have um, with the notion of the constitutive aspects of, of, of God is that, uh, and this might just be a certain type of naivety that I have with the philosophy of religion, is that a lot of Thomistics seem to be um, really, really uh, in, in, imbued in the concept, I guess, that God is both divinely simple and yet has all of these mental characteristics um, such as intentionality, a will, uh, a mind, uh, presumably concepts, presumably all good. Uh, I don't know how to square that away with the notion that he's divinely simple because those seem to be like composites of some sort and that's what they criticize nature as basically being is as a as a sort of composite if you will um and secondly it seems as though anytime we do talk about minds we presuppose bodies and i think kant even sort of i mean i don't i don't necessarily need to uh, appeal to kant but I, I kind of agree with him that i mean mental notions do seem sort of in a relevant sense embodied um, and God, if he is divine simplicity, doesn't seem to have a body. God, as a panentheistic conception, seems to have a body, which seems to be a necessary condition for a mind. Um, so those are sort of two problems that I have right there. Uh, the notion that we can square away all these various properties of God and call him divinely simple, and the notion that we can talk about a mind at all without a body or any of the sort of characteristics that we generally set up about with talking about experiences in any sort of transcendental way. I mean, you know that, you know, you can't have experiences without spatial temporal uh, constitutive aspects. So it seems very hard to say, well, we're even talking about a mind at all when we're talking about God's mind. We'd be, uh, why would we even make an analogy in the first place? And if we're making an analogy in the first place, well, they have to then participate in some univocity of being and so I always get myself back into this sort of panentheistic difficulty, if you, if, if, if you can kind of, uh, you know, appreciate or sympathize with this, this, sort, of, this sort of problem. I don't, I, mean, I don't know if you have anything to say to that. I, I think it's an enormously complicated problem. But uh, if you don't, we can also continue to the, the practical philosophy that you do feel a little bit more comfortable with. So. I don't know. I, think I have some thoughts on this. Um, but... I'm sympathetic to the, the objection. It seems that the, the main distinction one would want to draw is between um, finite and infinite minds, um, or rather, uh, finite minds and, and infinite minds. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that's drawn in the German idealist tradition. I mean, Fichte talks about this a little bit in his, um, uh, in 
um, the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Right, um, where he, he's trying to, um, the Foundations of Natural Right, where you know, he's trying to explain why is it that a finite mind has um, you know, conditions for its very possibility of self-consciousness requires all of these various conditions. Um, like it requires nature, it requires freedom such that it can be efficacious upon nature, it requires other beings with whom it can enter into relationships of recognition. All these are necessary that a, so that a finite mind can come to be aware of itself. Uh, it, it seems like the, the main distinction, and this is clear from the, the beginning of Fichte's Foundations of Natural Right, the only reason why any of these conditions are necessary is that a finite mind, it's of the nature of minds to know itself, engage in self-reverting activity, where its end right. yeah. the self object is itself, yeah, its self thought. Yeah. Self-positing, um, yeah, the self-positing nature of the eye, yeah. Um, but the self-positing of a finite eye can only be complete when it requires an anstos, you know, opposition, um, yeah. which, yeah, which renders it finite, but it has to somehow overcome that opposition. And, you know, one can see kind of the beginnings of, of Hegel, where you have nature and then spirit as the self-reversion of mind or something along those lines. It seems that, um, you know, that's only necessary because we've determined the minds to be finite. But in an infinite mind, the mind doesn't have to know itself discursively. It doesn't have to know itself through another. Um, you know, Aquinas says that the, mind, that the mind of God knows itself uh, directly. I think that there's interesting things we can say about the manner in which God's self-knowledge, you know, God being on the Aristotelian conception, the act of thought thinking itself, um, thought thinking itself without any um, determination, without any finitude, will not require any limit or any discursivity. Now, it turns out for Aquinas, you know, God's act of thinking himself generates a perfect image of the divine essence, which is why he thinks that there's a second person of the Trinity, the Son, and that God's act of, of loving himself, because a mind is self-directed intentionally, um, both theoretically and practically. Um, the practical self-love of God um, as the supreme good generates the spirit. So in Aquinas, you have this argument for the Trinity. Um, similar in some ways to the Hegelian argument for Trinity, although it's very different it's very different because they're not three stages of self-knowledge. Um, they're two different ways of self-knowledge uh, or self-directed activity. But it seems that it, like really the distinction that would allow a transcendent God of classical theism rests upon um, the analogy of being and that that rests upon the distinction between um, finitude and infinitude. Um, that finite thinking creatures are fundamentally different, although related, analogy to an infinite their yeah. activity of self can be different as well yeah i mean i i definitely hear you there um although as as you know i mean just you gesturing in that analogy gets me back into um and i, I don't mean to make this into a blood sport of course you know i mean <laughs> we, we 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 could kind of see where this uh this line of Fichte that you're that you're positing would just be taken forward by Schelling and then Hegel and then getting into the sort of conception that I, uh, I that I that I have, um, um, and and I think one a sort of conception that is because um, you mentioned the the sort of notion that we we don't necessarily have to consider ourselves as finite subjects, um, that notion I think comes from Spinoza. I don't think that he would say ultimately that subjects are finite. Um, although he has a sort of, uh, it's a sort of interesting view that I'm still trying to make sense of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I would still run the sort of same objections there. And then if I didn't have those objections against the sort of classic notion, I would have, um, I would have, well, in addition to the PSR argument that I'm, I'm saying right here that basically says that there's a, there's a univocity between the type of causality that god has and nature has i'd also run the same sort of transcendental arguments uh against god that kant has so we should just probably leap into uh into that uh conversation next if, if, if you don't mind um kind of going over kant's uh theoretical philosophy and his criticism of the ontological argument and cosmological argument if you can explain that for us what you what you think kant has to say about those and and uh, sort of your objections if you will. Sure, yeah. So um, Kant's criticism of the, the ontological argument in the, uh, in the first critique 
Um, the, the core of the criticism uh, with this kind of rolled out, um, whenever there's debate about the ontological argument, it's usually considered decisive. I think it is a good criticism, but it's usually rolled out without further elaboration, is that existence is not a real predicate. Um, so, um, should we go over the ontological argument, or do you think your listeners are familiar enough with, with that, that we pass over the structure of the... Um, um, the you, could, you could just, just, yeah, just give up if you can give the ontological argument real quick, or at least the way that you think Kant does it and the distinction between Anselm and how he would give it. I think you said that you think that there is a distinction between how they worded it. And I, I, that's kind of curious about that because I'm not, I'm not familiar with the nuances there. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the, um, so the, the ontological argument that Kant is responding to is the rationalist argument that emerges with, um, Descartes and receives a, a further formulation by Leibniz and that is you know, taken up by Christian Wolff and the other um, kind of mm -hmm. German rationalists. Uh, that's very different, I think, than the Anselmian argument. Um, so the ontological argument that Kant's responding to, what we call the rationalist ontological argument, says something like, well, you know, God is um, an end, an entity, um, that we, we have defined the, the essence of this entity is that which contains every possible perfection. So it's a perfect being. So a being that has every every perfection, every positive predicate, um, and any um, scalar predicate would have to an infinite degree. Um, one such perfection is existence. Um, so therefore, it falls from the essence of God that he would contain the predicate of existence. Therefore, God exists. That's the rationalist version of the argument. The Anselmian version, which is kind of Neoplatonist version of the, the ontological argument, is very different. Um, it is the idea, that it takes on, first of all, the classical theist conception of God as not a being with every perfection, um, but the purest or fullest act of being itself. Um, so kind of infinite, the infinite act of being. Um, and it reasons from that that, of course, um, the infinite act of being, um, based off of this kind of view of the hierarchy of beings, um, each finite being is a being via participation. Um, and this hierarchy of, of beings, um, you would know that the, the infinite act of being um, must exist. It's a kind of limit, uh, which is why Anselm says God is that which nothing greater can be thought. Um, if we could think something greater, then that would be the infinite act of being, and the um, lower level would not be infinite. He would be limited by some, some further principle. Um, I, I'm not uh, as uh, adept with the, the Anselmian or the kind of um, late medieval, or uh, sorry, the early medieval view, early scholastic view, but that's kind of the Anselmian view, which I think Kant is decidedly not responding to that. Um, that probably would have been unfamiliar to him. Um, he's responding to the rationalist version of the ontological argument. So Kant's objection to the rationalist version of the ontological argument is that um, existence is not one real predicate. We can get into what a real predicate is. Um, so it cannot be one among the many perfections of, contained within the concept of an infinite being. Um, consequently, merely the concept of an infinite being cannot derive from that concept the very existence of such a being. That's the yeah. core of the Kantian criticism. Yeah, so I guess for the audience, sure, creating a distinction between a real predicate and um, I guess was it a formal uh, predicate of, of, of existence for Kant? This is a merely logical predicate is the other kind. Yeah, okay. And, and so basically Kant is going to say we can talk about things as existing, but we wouldn't necessarily reason to existence, but from uh, from existence. Uh, and so there, there's a sort of way of where we're talking about uh, existence already from a sort of uh, receptive end, I guess, is how I, I take it, correct? Right, right. Okay. That's to do with what we said earlier about how Kant rejects a formal criterion of truth, right? He, he understands existence to be a determination of, of modality that's parasitic upon experience okay and what would your objection to kant necessarily be that existence just is a real predicate uh i mean one could argue that i think that kant's objection to the rationalist version of the ontological argument is decisive um so i'm with the, the consensus of most philosophers on that right um, you could dissent um, but I, I think that there are good reasons why Kant rejects the, um, the rationalist view 
that existence is a real predicate. Because if you believe that existence is a real predicate, you have this view that the um, that the concepts of these finite things are essentially indeterminate. Um, you have to once you list all of the essences, all, all of the predicates contained within the essence of something, a, a certain concept, and uh, you have to still list one additional, one further predicate to determine whether it, it in fact exists or not. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, um, how do general concepts, which presumably are indeterminate with respect to existence, how do they come to refer or apply to actual instantiations of those concepts? If they are different in the very concept itself. And when Kant says there is no distinction between a hundred tailors or dollars or whatever, a hundred gold coins, um, or a hundred actual gold coins and a hundred um, theoretical or potential gold coins, um, we understand that the hundred gold coins is the very same concept applying in both cases. But if you have the rationalist conception of existence as a further predicate, then they're not the same concept. Um, because one of the concepts contains a predicate existence, the other one lacks. Right. Um, so I think there's there's kind of philosophy of language, um, and how do how do these terms come to apply to diverse instances, to motivate Kant's view that uh, existence is not a predicate, can a real you, predicate. Can you can you clarify for the audience? It's been a long time since I've read that passage of where Kant talks about the distinction between uh, what was it uh, a, a, a real a, I, for, I forgot what you said in, in terms of the example real gold or what was it again um, I, I think he says like an actually existing hundred tailors T-H-A-L-E-R which is I don't know if it's time to get the dollar actually existing hundred dollars and a merely potential I'm forgetting the exact quote but that's gist of it Okay, so 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 you'd then think that Kant is um, he successfully manages to dismantle that. Um, do you think that his uh, so 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 what exactly what ex what exactly would you substitute? Um, what what would be the sort of rebuttal against Kant? Why do you why do you think he is the to use your uh, to use your phrasing the enemy uh, here with this uh, with this argument? I think here, um, here his rebuttal is actually a good thing because um, I, I don't believe that the rationalist version of the ontological argument works. Um, I think that, I mean, as a Roman Catholic, I think this is a fairly alien argument from scholasticism. It, it really comes from a very different um, tradition. Um, I mean, it's it's from kind of a Lutheran high scholasticism in Germany that's very rationalist, but it doesn't have very much to do with medieval scholasticism doesn't have much to do with Anselm's version of the ontological argument. I think it is a kind of like decadent form of scholasticism that depends upon certain suppositions about how existence is a, a real predicate, um, a determination of essence. It's a kind of essentialist version of the ontological argument. Okay. Whereas in the scholastic tradition, and this is something that is good about Kant's reputation, it recovers a real distinction between essence and existence. Existence is not a further determination of essence, for Kant, existence is a determination of our subjectivity. Um, uh, you know, we existence is a determination of um, you know our um, understanding, the fact of modality, in respect of some object. It's not a determination of the concept of an object. It would resolve existence into essence, which is very alien to the the Catholic view, the scholastic view. I think Kant's argument's good here, um, and we should should accept it. My understanding is that Hegel does repudiate Kant's form of the ontological argument. But it's in um, denying uh, he, he denies uh, he accepts the, the real distinction between existence and essence except in um, an infinite being. He asserts that there's a difference in kind between an infinite being and a, and a finite being. Um, so we can it makes sense to distinguish between a hundred possible and a hundred actual Dollars, um, it does not make sense to distinguish between a possible and an actual God. Tegel just understands God's pure actuality. Okay. Um, but that's kind of a, we have a very different view of the ontological argument. Is, is the idea just that the, the, it does, it's incoherent to say that it's possible that God exists? You, you always have to say, say it's possible. Okay. Um, and. Uh, 
And it's Hegel's conception of God, we should raise the Aristotelian view of, of pure actuality, um, or you know, pure thought, um, self presence of that thought. Um, at least that's the beginning of his view. Of course, it develops um, to this panentheistic view, mm-hmm. and it would be incoherent to say um, possible actuality, it's a possible pure actuality. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I get you. That makes sense. Um, some of the other stuff I'm kind of a little bit lost in. I think it's because I'm, I, I don't know anything almost about Ansem. So, um, but I think I get the, the general, the general gist. Um, let me, let me see. Um, yeah. What of the other questions that I kind of wanted to go over originally with you? I think we've kind of tackled a lot of them. Um, And, uh, I mean, if there's any subject you're interested in, um, most of what I work on is not Kant's um, theoretical philosophy or his philosophy of religion. It's mostly his moral and political. Um, but, yeah, I'm up to talk about whatever. Sure, I don't mind talking about that. Um, I'm trying to ask the audience if they have any questions, although we had most of the questions earlier in, and I'm probably going to have to go back to them. Um, most of the uh, most of the comments seem to be just comments at this point. <laughs> we'll get into yeah, I guess we'll we can get into a little bit of the political philosophy. Unfortunately, the political philosophy is probably something that I know almost nothing about uh, with respect to Kant. It's something that I mostly do is the theoretical, practical, and aesthetic. Kind of really into mostly metaphysics uh, when it comes to my interests. Um. I mean, do you, what exactly, I guess, yeah, to start this off, what exactly are your interests in the political philosophy? Um, what, what, yeah, what are your interests, I guess, to start it out there? Yeah, I mean, I'm mostly just interested in the history of political philosophy, so it's kind of just, Kant is a kind of, at least until very recently, there's some recent scholarship um, since 2011 or 2007 was Arthur Ripstein's book, called Force and Freedom, which revived a lot of interest in Kant's political philosophy. Up until that point, Kant was a kind of neglected figure in the history of political philosophy, um, not very well studied. Um, most of his pertinent relevance to modern uh, political philosophy is a kind of bastardized version of his moral philosophy taken over by John Rawls, um, which pays very little attention to what Kant himself wrote about politics. Um, so yeah, it's mostly historical interest. I think it's it's worthwhile to kind of flush out Kant as a thinker who really did have deep thoughts about political theory. That's the interest. I do. I guess the things that I do know about his political philosophy, I read a little bit. Um, I can't remember the name of the principle. You'll probably be able to uh, help me, but I think it was like the categorical maxim that we ought to harmonize basically our ends with the ends of the other with others um which is sort of complements one of the things within the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals that we should never treat people as means to an end but an end in themselves and so this this notion of right that uh kant has basically sort of um seems to uh what's the word um well, I guess harmonize with that 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 sort of maxim itself. Is there anything that you could kind of tell us about about that and where Kant sort of builds off of his concept of right from his practical philosophy and how that's instantiated in his political philosophy? Is that a fair question? Yeah, yeah. I think um, what you're th- probably thinking of is the universal principle of right, um, which he elaborates in the the doctrine of right, the Rex Lera, which is the first half of Kant's metaphysics of morals. The universal principle of right goes something like um, an action is right if it can coexist with everyone's freedom in accordance with universal law. Yeah. Um, phrasing, but that's something like it. And the um, big question in Kant's, obviously that resembles the categorical imperative or the, the form of a kingdom of ends, uh, that version of the categorical imperative. Very, very similar to the point that one would think there's some sort of relation between them, um, but it's, a, it's an issue of controversy in contemporary Kant scholarship, what exactly is the relationship between these? Um, is it one, I mean, the the, the most ambitious view um, that you simply deduce 
the universal principle of right from the categorical imperative. It's either deduced from it or um, an application of it. Um, I think uh, Stanley Rosen is one of the proponents of that view. Paul Geyer um, is a uh, proponent of the so-called derivationist view that it's somehow derived. Then you have people who are um, adamantly opposed to that, who advocate the so-called separation thesis, which holds that the universal principle of right has either some wholly different foundation um, or it has no foundation. Um, and, and someone like Marcus Wilschek or Thomas Poga would be advocates of the separation thesis. Um, those are kind of the two um, diametrically opposed schools. And then most people are you know, working out some sort of middle ground between them. Um, where, where do you find yourself um, on, on the issue? Are you, are you against the separation yourself? Yeah, I, I'm much closer to the, the derivationist uh, view. Because um, the separation thesis usually will argue that there's some sort of, um, that there's no foundation at all for uh, the universal principle of right, which is a pretty unsatisfying view of uh, yeah. the consciousness that was out there. Um, or there's um, some sort of there's some sort of foundation that's wholly disconnected from the rest of Kant's practical philosophy. Uh, so Thomas Poga, for example, thinks that there's a basically Hobbesian foundation uh, of the universal principle of right. Um, so they're kind of considerations wholly extrinsic to morality, which are motivating um, the Kant to deposit this principle. Seems very odd. I think that yeah, that's very odd and dissatisfying. Um, but a part of what motivates the separation thesis, I think, is the desire to make Kant relevant for contemporary analytic political philosophy. Um, and it turns out, um, on a very hardcore reading of the derivation thesis, that the only way to understand Kant's political philosophy is through the lens of transcendental idealism, um, or I should say through the lens of his philosophy. And if it turns out, as on my view, the only way to understand his moral philosophy is through transcendental idealism, it's kind of an all or nothing package, right? You get can only really get his political philosophy if you swallow the whole um, uh, pill of Kant's system. I don't want that. I, I, that's basically my interpretation of Kant, that you really only get the universal principle of right given the categorical imperative and given a specific interpretation of the categorical imperative that I offer. The one we discussed earlier about mm -hmm. um, this vision of a moral world, about organizing the sensible domain under the principle of of universal law, that depends on upon his transcendental idealism. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. I, I, I think I've heard of this. I mean, I, I mean, I know I have. I had the conversation actually with uh, Grant just before this. Um, well, before last Saturday, um, because we were talking about the very issue. If you did manage to separate the two, and we were kind of befuddled by that, we. We were wondering, like, well, it doesn't really make sense, like, what it, you know, separating Kant's ethics from um, uh, his theoretical philosophy, or separating uh, basically what you call the universal principle of right from his ethical philosophy. That's why I sort of also said the um, the very notion that we ought to treat people as ends instead of means to an end seems to be instantiated in the universal principle of right. If you believe that all of these categorical maxims ultimately lead you to the goodwill or what you know is basically the the notion of practical reason um if they all ultimately end up there it doesn't seem like that they can be divorced and i'm, I'm trying to wonder like what would the arguments be for a separationalist thesis i mean why are people why are people committed to that view at all? What's the what's the sort of what's the argument that they have, and how do they how do they get off the ground without any of the groundworks of the metaphysics of moral? Right. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm closer to the derivationist view, but I have some sympathies for the what's motivating the separationist thesis because I don't think it's. Um, you're right. There are people who say that well, Kant's universal principle of right is basically the formula of humanity sounds like you're just treating people as, as ends in themselves, or at least it would be implied by that. Um, so it's just a straightforward application uh, of that principle or a deduction from it. Um, and I think that that, it's, it's well motivated, but I think incorrect in a, in a kind of minor way, or you know, it's just off the mark. So there are kind of two motivations behind the separationist thesis. One is that Kant thinks that there's right, the principle of right, and the authorization to coerce are analytically identical. The concept of right contains within it the very concept of coercion. 
um, as implicit within right. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that coercion, sphere of coercion, is the outer, um, is our outer action, right? It's our external relations to one another, the way our actions interfere with one another. But the entire sphere of morality that Kant develops in the groundwork and in the uh, doctrine of virtue is all about the internal constitution of your willing. It seems like there are just kind of two different domains, the subjects um, of morality on the one hand, and or I should say ethics on the one hand, and right on the other. One is concerned with the internal disposition of your will. The other one is concerned with um, external action. One is concerned with the self-legislation of your will, that you're, you're being motivated by reason alone. And the other one is concerned with coercion, and therefore kind of abstracts from the motivation of your will. Coercion means, you know, a sensible incentive inclining you to act in a certain way. Yeah. Threat of punishment. The uh -huh. other reason, which I think is also compelling to motivate a separation thesis, is that there are two different points of view. The point of view of morality, although it's kind of impartial and universal, is the point of view of the particular subject, like, um, who is willing, um, and who is trying to determine if his own will conforms to the universal law. Point of view, so, so you'll note when Kant gives the formulations of the categorical imperative, he says, act in such a way that the maximum of your action, X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, the point of view of the universal principle of right is much more abstract. It's not first personal. So Kant, when he gives the formula of universe, uh, the universal principle of right, he says any action is right if it can coexist, whatever. Um, so he doesn't say act in such a way that. Um, so these are kind of two distinctions which I think are are well motivated. The latter one kind of leads us to think that I mean, both of them together lead us to think, well, it's not that you yourself, and Kant explicitly says this, universal principle of right demands that you yourself limit your freedom, not interfering with others. It just demands that your freedom be limited. Your freedom can be limited in spite of yourself through coercion. Um, and that seems to motivate a distinction between right as a different sphere of science, of practical science, and ethics. And the question is, uh, well, if morality just is ethics, which is kind of like the, the Poga view, then right's doing something else. It can't be um, related to the categorical imperative, mm -hmm. at least not essentially. Um, now, I think it, it's the case that right and ethics are two different spheres of morality. Um, you have this, this broader division, broader genus of which they're both species. Um, yeah. That was motivating the separation, why one would think that they're distinct. This notion of coercion, though, um, as being something that, if I'm, if, under, if I'm understanding you correctly, this idea that coercion is something antithetical towards the, the things that we're talking about in the groundworks for the metaphysics of morals and of moral philosophy altogether seems sort of strange to me. Because it doesn't seem like the concept of good or doing good or, you know, any of these sorts of moral maxims that we set up um, allies itself with the uh, idea that we could just do whatever we want or we can fulfill whatever ends we want. We have to sort of, in order to get at the good, we necessarily have to limit ourselves and our sort of actions um, in order to be agents, right? We have to be able to sort of be coerced by others such that we harmonize our own ends with their ends. So I'm not, I, I'm not really sure how coercion is something that could be necessarily separated from moral philosophy. I mean, it seems as though the, yeah, it seems as though the notion of even building an ethic seems to be a sort of mutualistic endeavor. Uh, but I, but I could be, but I could be wrong there. Um, yeah. I think you're definitely onto something. I mean, I, I'm not a proponent of the, the, the separation thesis. Um, so I think you're right that um, there is a, a relation of some sort, um, and I have a very specific view on what that is, between uh, coercion or right and uh, the moral law. But note the distinction that you uh, have subtly point out there, that on the one hand, in order to, um, to apprehend and affect the good, in order to have a good will, we have to limit ourselves. There's a, there's a line in um, Schelling, a very early work of Schelling, um, it's Schelling's essay on natural right, mm -hmm. 1796 or something, where he says, you know, when you encounter humanity or rational nature, um, your like conscience shouts to you, you know, come no further, you know, not 
you, you must respect this other person. I think he says something like, come no further or something. And note that it's your own conscience that um, demands that you not interfere with another person or not treat them as a mere means. In the sphere of right, it's not necessarily your own conscience, right? Even the criminal will be subjected to the universal principle of right. The person um, who has no conscience at all, um, or undeveloped conscience or whatever, they will be coerced to prevent them from interfering in the, the, the freedom of another as well. The question is, well, on one hand, morality concerns the um, capacity of reason to determine itself, the, the uh, practical reason to serve as its own determining ground of action, to limit uh, freedom, external freedom. On the other hand, uh, right concerns any incentive. It could be a sense of duty, but it could also be um, the threat of punishment, a sensible inclination. Act only from a, a fear of punishment, then it's not a moral action. Like the shopkeeper who refuses to cheat his customer in the groundwork right. because he fears that he's caught is not acting morally. He right. might be acting according to right. That's kind of the distinction. Right. I'm um, I don't I I obviously don't know about much about this the, the political issues that you're relaying, but I've always had this intuition, and I guess at least an argument for the notion that. I mean, it seems like even the notion of subjectivity, um, and this is more along the lines of maybe Hegel and Fichte, the notion of agency, the notion of subjectivity, the notion of self-consciousness seems to be fundamentally um, brought out through a relationship with others. And maybe even presumably ethics seems to be fundamentally brought out through others. I mean, there seems to be a very sort of simple argument, which was brought to my attention by Mumford and, and McDowell, and I, and I think this kind of uh, bleeds in nicely to, um, to Hegel as well, is that if we have minds such as ours, right, if we have a notion of self-consciousness such as ours, um, that immediately sort of presupposes propositional beliefs, having propositional attitudes, having a notion of the I, which is obviously going to be propositional, um, you know, having a unity of beliefs that seem to sort of cohere and which we can pull out of in order to make certain types of intentional actions, all of these types of things. Um, they seem to have a very, to, you know, use a meta-ethical term, you know, a cognitive import right there. And cognitive imports such as those, propositional attitudes, yada, yada, um, don't seem to be possible without a language. Um, and language presupposes, if we take Wittgenstein's private language argument seriously, a community of people. Therefore, consciousness, self-consciousness, which depends upon language, which depends on a community. Um, well, now we see that ultimately what we are and what we think is ultimately going to be dependent upon some sort of community that, you know, builds who, who we are. Um, and so these notions don't seem to be separated from what other people are and the sort of demands that they make upon uh, uh, upon us. Does, does that make some sort of sense? Yeah, I think this is a good criticism of Kant. Um, yeah, Kant's... because because Kant seems to be, you know, sort of developing the sort of notion of, I, I don't know, because I, I don't know completely because there has to be some sort of, um, there has to be some sort of story um, developmental story for how we develop ethics in Kant, and, and some people might demonstrate how that's, you know, growing up with a community and whatever. But yeah, anyway, sorry, yeah, go ahead. So, so Kant, um, I think this is a big problem, and this is something I'm trying to address in my dissertation. Um, what are the foundations of sociality for Kant, um, or um, um, the human communities? That Kant seems not to have quite made the, the leap that someone like Fichte and Hegel after him or on the other hand, kind of this um, linguistic leap that is like Erder and Hamann, and then you can see in Wittgenstein, um, Kant seems to still be operating in this kind of classical view um, that you, you can assume kind of the isolated individual as the, the subject of, of philosophy, you can have you know, moral knowledge on, on his own, that human sociality is a merely natural um, phenomenon, that the fact that human beings have to live in community with others, that's just due to em empirically contingent natural facts like, oh, you know, we can't survive without a division of labor that can support our life or whatever. 
or um, you know, human beings don't come into existence except through sexual reproduction, which requires community with others, or whatever. I mean, he also does think that, well, do come to uh, awareness of the moral law, we come to be disciplined and be fully good persons through our contact with other people who will you know, morally educate us. Um, all of these are just reasons why human, um, uh, you know, human potentials are our final moral perfection depends upon other people. Not reasons for con why human self-consciousness or consciousness of morality is a distinctive sphere of, pr of practical cognition, why these depend upon other human beings. So when Kant introduces the concept of right, he has a metaphysical foundations of, of right, a metaphysical deduction of the concept of right. I shouldn't say deduction. He has a metaphysical concept of right. His path is he introduces the concept um, by populate that human beings do in fact live with one another and then what is necessary given that postulate um, to bring this into accord with the the concept of right well he has these various deductions of institutions like property contract and status relations the state and so on fixed strategy is very different right Fichte begins with the fact of self-consciousness for a finite rational being he says well such self-consciousness is ultimately only possible if we are in community with other human beings or if we have been in community through an act of recognition, right. Right. and Fichte says, well, that's ultimately only possible if we have certain ways of relating to those people, which is through the concept of right, ultimately property, contract, state, and so right. on. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think Kant has quite made that leap yet. That's a development that, and that that's very also lingu that's very different than the linguistic route, the Wittgenstein private language argument, which I think is also politically very interesting. Um, but, you know, maybe someone like Herder or Hamann, these kind of linguistic critics of Kant, who say, well, um, you know, Kant's philosophy, or, you know, all philosophy is ultimately parasitic upon language, which is limited to a determinate community at a specific moment in time, um, and therefore, you know, self-consciousness depends upon, um, you know, human sociality or historicity or whatever. I don't know enough about Kant's philosophy of language. I think um, Michael Forster has a book on Kant's philosophy of language, or maybe an essay on it, um, that might be interesting along these lines. But he's, uh, he's the guy. Like... Yeah, go, go, uh, no, he's the guy that wrote the book on Kant and skepticism, right? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. In either case, um, it seems like Kant has a very different path to sociality, and the German idealists, this view that sociality is necessary for self-consciousness the German romantics with this view that sociality and language or self-consciousness, consciousness at all and language are linked together. Um, Kant seems to just take self-consciousness for granted. Um, I mean, it depends upon cognition of objects other than ourselves. In the theoretical domain, we have to, that's the refutation of skepticism. Right. Well, not not sure if it's the refutation. I, I know that it's so, somewhat controversial that he even has a refutation of, of skepticism whatsoever. But I pardon me, refutation of idealism. What's that? Pardon me, I meant the refutation of idealism. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you are right. Uh, it might just be because I'm not super, super duper well read, rock star Kantian scholar. But like, I don't, I don't really see too much too much in con if i'm trying to think off the top of my head between um in terms of uh language and community although he does have the notion of communicenses and there is the critique of judgment of where he basically has some sort of notion of how the aesthetic judgment is going to be based upon a community of people interacting with each other but i don't know if i could make sense of that in my head right now in terms of how that's going to apply to this situation um, but yeah, I mean, some of the things that you said there are pretty interesting. I don't, I, I, I don't know if it necessarily has to, uh, I, I don't know how Wittgenstein would relate to, um, the one thing that I didn't understand that you said, I don't know how Wittgenstein's private language argument would, would develop into politics, uh, other than in a sort of very abstract way. Can you kind of clarify what you mean there? Yeah, it, I mean, in a very abstract way, the private language argument, my understanding of it, it, it shows how human thought, which is ultimately dependent upon language as the medium of thought, mm -hmm. um, 
is, is parasitic upon a um, community, upon a yeah, community okay. of interlocutors. And that um, certain people, Hannah Pitkin is a political theorist who's taken this argument in, in this direction and basically shown that, well, you know, concepts of, of politics, of, of right, for instance, parasitic upon um, a community as a, as a distinctive form of linguistic practice or you know, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. distinctive language game, I should say. Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. I, I, I'm pretty sold on at least, you know, the, the private language argument. It doesn't seem like a language can be created um, from one subject or an isolated subject. It seems as though the very notion of communication and language presupposes normativity. Um, that is to say, you know, the concept of whatever this word means has a certain type of normative standard, which, I mean, it, it can be at least at the very minimal a conventionalist standard, but it is one that's going to be ultimately done um, above and over one person, right? Because if one person was deciding what a language would be about, then he would never be an error. They would never be an error, but obviously they are an error, so there seems to be some sort of force uh, from the outside um, correcting uh, the sort of standards that they have in terms of their language. And there seems to be some sort of notion of um, language is being built intersubjectively through a community. And I think that would, you know, and I agree with you, that would follow into the notion of self-consciousness as well, if it's propositional. I don't know about like other aspects of the mind, like, you know, awareness of oneself. I, I don't think that that probably obviously doesn't require language because I don't, I, de I definitely don't think that animals have propositional attitudes and all that. Um, I'm not sure if animals are aware of themselves in the same way that Fichte talks about. And if they were, that gets us into some deep trouble uh, with, with respect to some of these, uh, some of these issues. So, yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to toss into some of the questions that have been pulling up, although these, uh, looks like they're not going to be entirely on Kant. If you don't have any opinions, we could skip over them and talk about some other things and then kind of wrap this up on the three hour dot. I'm sure you have, um, you know, things that you want to do today and I don't want to eat up all your time here. Um, so the first question is, uh, I guess for both of us, but um, I'll, I'll relegate it to you for now. Um, and it was basically a question about what do you think between, I guess, the, um, uh, the philosophy or the ontology of being versus becoming. And if you think there is an, an opposition there, if, if, you, if, you, if you had to pick one side, which one would you pick? Um, if you have any thoughts there. My, my understanding is that, you know, on, on the Hegelian view, for example, the uh, becoming is, is one moment. Of, uh, the, each is a distinct moment in the unfolding concept of being. He has, um, you know, a notion of, of, of pure being um, and then becoming and then you know, uh, identity and difference or persistence to change. Um, so so I, I guess I'm, I'm sympathetic to some, some position like that. Um, yeah. Other than blocks or something. There's a there there's a really good book. Uh, I think he's he's asking like uh, generally like when we can when we talk about objects within the world or whatever. I don't know if you've read um, Kant's philosophy of nature or Schelling's philosophy of nature, the mature philosophy or Hegel's nature, but they seem to be at least in part committed to a sort of ontological thesis that a lot of things are a process or in a state of becoming. Um, you can kind of do these interchangeably. Um, in Kant, we get these sort of notions that nature is, um, like even the very notion of matter is um, two processes kind of intertwined, the notion of repulsion and attraction. We get also this in, in, um, in Schelling. However, there's been a lot of good work, and I was going to make the book recommendation for you to try to read John Dupree. Um, uh, he has a great book. Uh, it's in Philosophy of Biology about process ontology. Uh, but it, uh, I think it has a lot of Schillingian elements there, basically, as seeing an object, and Fichte does this too with the subject, seeing an object as basically a moment of stasis of... The object is a sort of abstracted, abstracted thing from various processes working in an intertwined way. 
in the, in the way that Kant conceived of community. Um, so like, what is the body, right? It's not just an organ, a head, whatever. It's various types of processes like metabolism, homeostasis, and all these kinds of things working together, electromagnetism. And when we can join them all together, then we have a product of these various types of processes that we abstract and we call that the sort of the object. So what's really fundamental about these isn't some sort of substance uh, or being, but rather this continual act of becoming. And that is ultimately what a lot of people think that life is. It's not this thing that we can kind of box in, but this ultimate, um, this ultimate, um, uh, I guess to use a Greek word, something within continuous kinesis, right? So um, I'm not sure if you're too familiar with, with, with that realm of uh, ontological works, but that's something that I'm really into as well with process ontology. Uh, that's um, a little bit alien to me. I mean, I have read um, Kant's Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science. Um, so, I mean, it, it's worth noting that in, in the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science, you know, he does have a dynamic theory of, of matter um, as you know, composite, uh, repulsive, and attractive force, but it, it, it produces certain stabilities, right? That, you, know, you get stable, relatively rigid material objects, but they depend upon forces that, that are dynamic determining one another um, yeah yeah i'm not it's i'm not, not yeah go ahead theory of, it's not you know pure flux where there's nothing um, rigid and intelligible on it but it's produced through this, this process it's dynamic yeah there needs to be a sense of where the processes attempt to accomplish some sort of end and that's what makes it ultimately teleological but that end there, there's a way in which it doesn't come to a conclusive end. It doesn't ever reach a, a sort of stasis, but I wouldn't say that that makes the processes unintelligible. So like the way that we make sense of say rain, it's raining outside or a tornado or electricity is through a temporally extended moment. Um, so it's not that, you know, if we do talk about processes, they're sort of incoherent or indeterminate or whatever, it's, but it's precisely that we can only make sense of these through an extended period of time, through a continuous notion instead of a discrete notion. And I do think, you know, at least Kant makes a distinction between the discrete and continuous, and especially within the transcendental, I think, analytic, when he talks about time, right, as being this sort of continuous thing, and something that we have to understand cont uh, as continuity. Um, so I don't know if you want to answer this. Are there similarities in between formalism in philosophy and formalism in art, geometrical abstraction and so on? And what are the similarities? Um, I think that would be that's an interesting question. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, there's a very interesting, uh, uh, essay by the philosopher Ortega y Gasset. Um, called on the dehumanization of art, and he was a kind of neo-Kantian philosopher, and he was, you know, defending the so-called dehumanization of art, um, which he associated with modern abstract art. Uh, the, and his view that the Kantian um, aesthetic theory, where um, you know the beautiful, um, you know, our aesthetic experience, the beautiful fixates only upon the abstract and formal features of an object, um, with devoid of content. Best form of art for a Tayyip Gasset would be art, which is absolutely devoid of content, which is approaching the point of, of contentless art that is merely abstract, and that's why he thinks that the uh, um, highest aesthetic experience would be art, uh, would be modern abstract art, uh, which is fully dehumanized; it's fully without content. So there is a sense in which I think, yeah, that sort of formalism in the um, in the theoretical realm lends itself to a kind of aesthetic formalism. It's interesting. I've never, uh, I never quite heard about, I've uh, never quite thought about formalism. I know there's also expressionism, which would be sort of also, you know, you get things like just a, a dot on a, on a canvas or something like that. And that's ultimately trying to express something instead of looking at the content itself. So I, I definitely hear it there. I'm, I actually kind, uh, kind of am curious. Are you also sort of sympathetic to the idea of beauty existing in and of itself as well, or are you very so much with Kant and that there's a there's something necessary within the, the 
the third critique that aesthetic judgments sort of check our own pulse, if you will, that we that we sort of have this generative capacity um, when we make aesthetic judgments to sort of imbue objects with beauty um, with, through our own mediation, through the sort of mediation of the understanding and imagination. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think that, um, you know, if you look at classical philosophy, um, my understanding is that the, uh, you know, the, the classical or scholastic view of beauty is that beauty is a kind of transcendental, which means, you know, it's one of the, um, of the transcendental properties of being. Um, being is truth for theoretical cognition, goodness for moral cognition, unity. Um, but that beauty um, is something like the, uh, the appearance of, be of being for a subject. Um, and that therefore, it does always have this kind of subjective moment, um, which Kant is right to hit on. You know, it always does make recourse to our own reflective judgment. Um, but I, I don't really have strong views about the kind of the metaphysics of beauty. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical about the Kantian view that it can only be only resolved into our own um, uh, you know, aesthetic response. It's it's not anything to do with kind of the, the objective formal features of the thing. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Objective pronouns to beauty. I think we're on the on the same page on a lot of these issues, Andrew. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm also skeptical about the idea that beauty only exists, you know, as a s sort of generative quality of, of the subject or, you know, that ethics is only something that's going to be constitutive of the subject. It's really hard because, especially with beauty, you know, because then you begin saying things like, well, I mean, this is objectively beautiful, this movie, this is objectively a beautiful book, sort of, um, sort of creates tension with other people. And then also it seems very hard for us to say, you know, um, it's unethical to ba uh, bomb, say, Mount Fuji uh, because it's beautiful or because it's unethical in itself or something like that. But I am actually sympathetic to the idea that beauty would actually literally be lost if we destroyed, you know, huge mountains within, within nature. I don't know anyone specifically that argues it. It's just a, it's just a sort of sympathy that I've had um, to be pushed into a lot of my positions, mostly because of the later German idealism, into a lot of realist stances. But no. Which um, later German idealists interest you? Uh, Sch Schelling the most. I've read about four of his works. I read, um, ah, God, I, it's, it's always hard to um, figure them all out. I have them right here in the back of me, probably. Uh, the Ideas of the Philosophy of Nature, The Outlines of the Philosophy of Nature, those are the first two that I read. Um, what were the other ones that I read? Um, it's not going to be. Oh yeah, the system of the system of transcendental idealism. I read a little bit about his essay on the unconditional and human freedom, although his freedom stuff still sort of perplexes me. I understand sort of how freedom works within Kant and what the unconditioned is in Kant, but it seems. I'm just I just don't quite get the movement yet of how one places the unconditioned away from the subject and back into nature. That seems to be what Kant, I mean sorry, what Schelling basically wants to do is show how nature is itself free. And if you do have this sort of teleology, I guess within nature and this sort of normativity you can kind of see, although, like again, it's ambiguous exactly what that means for me. You can kind of see how nature has this sort of generative and free movement about itself. It sort of is its own, um, is its own uh, cause and effect, if you will. Like you know how Kant talked about, you know, the subject being its own self-legislating force. It seems as though nature provides its own material in order to or produces its own material from its own formal properties in order to dialectically get at something greater um you know it it seems very odd to me that everything in the world would be this giant cosmological coincidence it seems what is occurring is that nature is slowly becoming to realize it realizing itself and I think it realizes that ultimately in itself, in sort of a Schillingian view through the subject, um, so sort of emergent processes eventually into the movement into self-consciousness 
and then you know if we get into hegelian things into ultimately absolute knowing um and if you read someone like Beiser, right, within the, the huge tome that he wrote on German idealism, there's also a very interesting um, interpretation. There's also interesting interpretations of Schelling's nature, if it's hylomorphic or not, if it has act and potency, if it's a form of non-reductive emergentism. Uh, I'm not sure too much at what's at stake, but some people, uh, Beiser mentions, reject emergentism. Uh, because he thinks that, or he, some people think that emergentism commits you to the idea that nature is ultimately arising from something non-complex and more primitive, and then complexity arises from those primitive concepts. Uh, whereas act and potency might not commit you to that view, it would be the case that what was potent originally in nature, what was highest, was there the entire time, and it was basically becoming actualized as nature sort of progresses. And I'm actually more sympathetic towards that latter view. I, uh, you know, one that ultimately goes back to all the way to Plato, I think out of all people is that um, nothing can arise from nature that, you know, complexity can't arise or greatness can't arise from something, um, something more simple or more primitive in, than what was originally there. Um, so yeah, I'm you know sort sort of committed to those views, sort of committed to very non-reductive philosophies. Um, I generally uh, don't think consciousness is reducible to you know the brain or body, but I also um, but I also don't think that uh, biology can be reduced down to chemistry, and chemistry can't really be reduced down to physics. So I have sort of a pluralism of things that I think are irreducibly complex. Um, I really don't buy into, you know, if we want to get into further topics, I don't really buy into this idea of like neurological nihilism. I think it's a sort of scapegoat for a lot of people, um, especially when it comes to, as you well may know, the cosmological argument. People say nothing is created or destroyed. You know, it's it's just the same fundamental particles basically being arranged chair wise or something like that, which I just think is ultimately some of the dumbest stuff that I've heard in, in metaphysics. So I'm not I'm not very sympathetic to that. Um, but I don't, I don't know what your ideas are there. So. I, I don't have ideas about a lot of this stuff. I, I was going to ask you, although you kind of answered it, um, this, this teleological conception of nature, mind is like the actualization of something which is potent in nature. Uh -huh. um, it's originally kind of implicit within nature. Whether, you know, if, if there's nothing in the effect that is not already seemingly contained in the cause, um, does this provide an argument for a kind of like world soul or something, or just that mind is, is latent within nature um, and has to be made visible or something like that. Um, I mean, my understanding of Schelling, and I haven't read very much Schelling at all, is that he he's in the system of transcendental idealism, he's providing kind of a long Kantian or 50 lines, like a deduction of nature from the, from the subject, and the philosophy of nature, he's just doing the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, a deduction of from nature. And then you have kind of these two parallel systems these two parallel um ads question is how do they intersect yeah um well the that's 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 a, a sort of complicated question i'm not sure if i can give you a robust answer to that some people basically think that the system of transcendental idealism was a regress on schelling's part they think that the outlines and his natura philosophy was ultimately where he should have gone and then he sort of slipped back into a more subjectivist Fichtean line of argumentation um, within within that work, um, and it's it's really hard to uh, know whether that is whether that is true or not. I would have to go back into reading Schelling more, but um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly who took up this this sort of defense that he sort of I think it might have been Bruce Matthews, uh, sort of a Schellingian scholar who thinks that that's a sort of retro, uh, regressive move. Um, and I, I know even less about his, almost nothing about his late philosophy uh, to where he really develops freedom. But ultimately where I think Schelling was the most right is in his, in, his, in his beginning philosophy where he wants to place the subject back into nature. And he has that quote, you know, um, trying to remember it. You can't think of the subject as, as thinking nature. You have to conceptualize nature as thinking itself through our minds or as the sub through the subject itself so we're sort of a vehicle of nature understanding itself instead of 
um, sorry, instead of abstracted in some sort of noumenal realm or transcendental realm. I, I don't know how people sort of um, uh, create a distinction between the noumenal and transcendental subject, but you can understand, you know, that this has, as you said, a sort of dualistic, uh, dualistic uh, metaphysics that we want to sort of avoid. Uh, if that if that all makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, there's a really good book that I read uh, like three years ago by I think it's John Laughland, might be John McLaughlin. Um, he's uh, it's on Schelling. I can I can send it to you. But it's, um, it's it's on kind of the the evolution of Schelling's thought, um, at least the system of transcendental idealism, all the way to his, his very late thought, like the 1840s, 1850s. Um, the philosophy of revelation, the philosophy of mythology. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting. He argues that Schelling eventually kind of abandons the whole project of objective idealism, recovers some kind of like Neoplatonist metaphysics that um, and Schelling closer to a more conventional kind of Christianity. I think John Laughlin might be high church Anglican, or he might be Catholic, but um, I mean, it's, it's a religious interpretation of Schelling that tries to make him more orthodox. Which the book was criticized, mm -hmm. um, but it's in. Sorry, I, I, I'm not sure if you cut off in that last bit. It's it's a little bit more off orthodox. What? Oh, that he he tries to interpret Schelling as a more orthodox Christian, lowercase o orthodox Christian. Oh, um, okay. I, yeah, I kind of abandoned his criticism of Hegel in his late life, and kind of the push towards the um, mm -hmm. philosophy of Revelation. Yeah, I think that this pushes from panentheism. Yeah, I don't know enough about this. Book. Yeah, no, no, neither do so. I. It seems as though a lot of people who are Schellingians um, mostly are very sympathetic to the original Schelling, the the mythology, the revelation. It seems most people sort of abandon Schelling there and think he's just gone off the deep end. I don't, I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, uh, something that I might be later getting into. I don't know if the freedom essay is completely loony because we have people like Zizek who are very infatuated with that, uh, with that, uh, that piece of work right there. Heidegger too. I really like the freedom essay. Yes. Yes. He, he wrote an entire book responding to that. Um, so we got another question. I would like to hear Andrew's explanation of the term disinterested delight in the aesthetic judgment sure so that um yeah the third critique is tough um my understanding of kant's view is that it's, so the fo distinctive form of pleasure uh that we receive from uh aesthetic experience from the sort of reflective judgment that is involved in aesthetic experience interested delight takes place um and we gratify some uh, sensible inclination. But it is interested in, in two senses. One, we have uh, a sensible interest in it. You know, it's some sort of um, uh, element of our uh, uh, desire that's involved. Two, it's interested because precisely because it is sensible, um, it is something peculiar to us. It's a, it's a contingent fact of our empirical and sensible natures that we have an interest in, for example, um, uh, slating our, our thirst by, by drinking something. Um, the disinterested delight that is peculiar to uh, aesthetic experience is such that, that the kind of pleasure that we, we have is something that is not linked to, uh, is something we uh, experience not because of any particular desire peculiar to us that we are gratifying. Um, it's rather because of this um, play of our, our faculties, this harmony of our, our faculties that results from reflective judgment, that we have merely as rational beings um, excited by this um, aesthetic object. And because that's something that we share with everyone else, because they as rational beings would have um, the same sort of response to this object, or at least it, it purports to be something that we would share with everyone else um, because it's peculiar to our uh, subjectivity. Um, that is why the disinterested delight of aesthetic experience is universal, purports to be universal, which is why um, aesthetic judgments like this object is beautiful, make a claim on other people that they ought to agree with me. This object elicits um, 
aesthetic pleasure, the disinterested delight of aesthetic pleasure. Whereas this object tastes good um, is not something that I claim others ought to assent to because it's something peculiar to my own interested delight that I take in the object. That's my understanding of um, concept of disinterest in aesthetic judgment. Are you, um, are you also sympathetic to the criticism uh, by some Kantian scholars that Kant cannot reconcile the um, the notion that um, he both a wants universalism and two he denies sort of determinate judgments and objectivity with respect to uh, aesthetic judgments. How can we have this sort of universal standard, if you will, or ascend to universality without having a criterion for universality? Um, he denies one and affirms the other. Yeah, this does seem to be a bit of a problem. Um, I think Beiser has a, a book criticizing Kant, kind of in defense of the German rationalist aesthetic tradition, um, like Wolf and, and Winkelmann and whatever else, uh, prior to Kant. Where he argues that Kant kind of unfairly throws out elements of this rationalist tradition, that our aesthetic judgment really does correspond to some feature, be a formal feature of an object. Um, grounds its universality yeah for Kant, it's like almost utterly mysterious what it is about beautiful objects that we find beautiful yeah all right um we're definitely approaching three hours um i did probably want to cut it here uh pretty soon uh is there anything that you want to talk about real quick or do you think we should wrap it up or how, how are you feeling on time uh, there's nothing that comes to mind. I mean, I'm not rushed on time, so if there are any final questions or if you have any subjects you wanted to, to touch up on and discuss in the last few minutes, um, it's fine. I mean, I mean, you know, if I did, it would be probably like personal questions, like why, why would you be committed to um, categorical imperatives or, you know, like what, what do you find the strength of categorical imperatives? Because uh, I'm always trying to... Um, yeah, we, we, let's do that one last question and then and then call it. Um, uh, do, do you have like a, a sort of argument for categoricity and why we shouldn't only be committed to hypothetical norms yourself? Yeah, so I think for, for Kant, um, the argument kind of stems from his um, moral Platonism. The Kant thinks, you know, what is the project, the groundwork and this, this critique? Well, it's identifying goodness as such. Um, the only thing that is good, unconditionally a good in itself, is a good will. Um, and then Kant has to analyze, unpack, unravel the concept of a good will. So he says he introduces the very notion of duty in order to unravel um, the, the essence of a good will. And the, um, the essence of a good will, he thinks, is a will devoid of any particular end, um, any particular subjective end. Um, it can only be universality of willing as such. Um, so it, it seems that it's kind of baked into the cake from the uh, earliest steps of the groundwork. His, his moral Platonism looking at goodness as such, um, or moral goodness as such, um, you know, sends him on the path towards a categorical universal imperative. Whereas if you have a very different conception of goodness, that, oh, there is no goodness as such, there's only peculiar, particular instantiations of, of goodness. In a certain way, you might think this is similar to the, the critique of the notion of metaphysics as the study of being as such. There, there is no being as such. There's um, you know, a particular determinate being. Um, if you have that sort of view, then you might push against um, Kant's you know, moral Platonism. But I think given the way Kant sets up the question, he guarantees the answer is a categorical imperative. Sure. Okay, well... Um... I think we'll wrap it up there. I do I do want to give you an invite to some of the reading groups that we're going to be starting with in two weeks, Andrew. I mean, I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, fairly, fairly informative. Uh, it's good discussing theology, or sorry, uh, the philosophy of religion with, um, with someone that studied Kant and the German idealists, especially, you know, getting those outside opinions. What we're going to do in TPC, if you wanted to join us, um, and this is going to be some undergraduates, maybe some professional philosophers, some professors, um, if they're interested. We're going to be doing a, a very large project starting in about a week or two about the uh, panentheistic controversy or the pantheistic controversy. So we're going to be reading Jacobi, 
uh, Lessing, um, uh, Kant, some other various thinkers who sort of, uh, and Mendelssohn, uh, uh, basically, you know, their uh, opinions on all the all these types of things and exactly how that moves into a panentheistic conception later in Schelling and, and Hegel. So if you wanted to join us there, you're you're definitely more than welcomed. Um, and, you know, uh, welcome to talk anytime in the future in TPC if you wanted to talk to some of the graduates there like John. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, give me a, a PM. Um, but yeah, I. But yeah, um, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having us, uh, or, or rather being on for with us uh, for three hours. Um, I'll give you a PM, and uh, we'll call it a we'll call it a day for this episode. All right. All right. Thanks for having me on. Definitely interested. Okay.